All right, so the next presenter that we've got is uh, Dr. Alexander Wendt. I'm gonna talk to you in terms of uh, also the schedule that we've got here. There was a break that was following Alex, and Alex, and what we're going to do is, if you would, if you just have to go to the restroom or something like that, go ahead and do that, because right after that we have lunch, okay? And that will allow me to make up some time that we've lost, and we'll be able to keep the schedule in place. So the next presenter is Dr. Alexander Wendt. He's gonna be talking to you about something that's rather different, uh, and I, I, I wanna couch this in the context. Are you all aware of the fact that, like Stephen Hawking, I was making the question, do we really want to contact aliens? You know, what, what do we expect that the response would be? <laughs> Is that a good thing for us? Do we do, we do like, uh, you know, the conquistadors going over to another continent, and what do we expect from that? Anyway, uh, he's going to be talking about dangerous knowledge, UFO science, and the existential threat to the state. Alexander Wendt is professor of political science at The Ohio State University, where he taught since 2004, after previous appointments at Yale, Dartmouth, and the University of Chicago. In addition to his day job, he's been interested in the UFO problem since about April 1999, first as a hobby and later as a serious research interest. He has published Sovereignty and the UFO in the journal Political Theory in 2008 and did a TEDx talk uh, early in 2020, entitled Wanted, A Science of UFOs, and is currently writing a book on themes in his talk. Please welcome, if you would, Dr. Alexander Wendt. Um, he's going to be joining us virtually. Okay. Thank you, Rich. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Rich. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I'm still hearing a pretty bad echo of my own voice or I'm hearing your voice, maybe once it stops. Do me a favor and turn your volume on your computer down. We don't need to hear it coming through your computer. Now, can you hear me now? We hear you fine. Okay, so I can't hear you then though, right? Uh, well, we're just concerned about the fact that there is that feedback loop, but can you, can you just go ahead and do your presentation? Okay, I'll give my presentation, we'll see how it goes. All right. Um, Okay, I think uh, there is an echo still, but hopefully I'll be able to sort of talk my way through this. Concerned about the fact that there is that feedback loop, but can you can you just go ahead and do your presentation? Yes, I will try to do the presentation. Although I'm hearing the feedback loop, but we'll give it a try. Um, so thank you, Rich, for and thank you all for coming. Um, and I also wanted to say that the slides that I have for the talk are a little bit dated, and so I'm going to be having to sort of work around the structure of the talk on, that's in the slides. Um, can we load the talk? Is that? There we go. Okay. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to talk around the actual uh, talk that you see on the screen. Um, and I want to begin with a few words about how I came to be here. Um, and actually, Rich did part of that already. I'm a political scientist. Uh, I study international politics. And as you'll see in the talk, um, that actually makes a difference in terms of how I think about this issue. Um, but in April 99, I had, actually the feedback is really bad. I'm not, be, I, this is going to be very hard to talk through. Is there a way to? Alex, if you can, please turn your volume down on your PC. Okay. All right, is this gonna be okay? Oh, I, okay, you can hear me still? Um, all right, so April 99, I had an epiphany about the UFO problem, which was that there actually was a problem. Um, and then as Rich mentioned in 2008, I, uh, next please, I uh, published an article called Sovereignty in the UFO. Um, there it is right there, um, which I believe is actually still the only article ever published by a social scientist that takes the ET uh, hypothesis for UAP seriously, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, just to, the, the puzzle, this article though, I think sets up my talk pretty well because the puzzle driving the article was why is it that for 70 some years, there's been a taboo on studying what we used to call UFOs scientifically. And given that, if any of those UFOs were discovered to be ETs, it would arguably be the most important event in human history. So you would think somebody would be looking, somebody would spend the money to study it. And yet, as we all know, of course, 
in those seven decades. The authorities have routinely denied even the existence of UFOs, uh, much less that they might be alien spacecraft and so on. So this is true, I think, even after the Pentagon report, this taboo is very strong still. There's a lot of resistance, although the taboo is clearly cracking. Okay. So anyway, in the article back in 2008, our solution or our answer to the question, why isn't anything happening? Why is there this taboo? Our answer was that the modern state cannot take UFOs seriously because the modern state is based on an anthropocentric assumption that the only intelligent life around is human. And so to question UFOs would be in a sense to question the foundations of the modern state and, and world order. So it's a legitimacy question. So our argument essentially was that the UFO taboo was functionally necessary for the modern anthropocentric state to survive. So fast forward 13 years to the Pentagon report, and it might seem as if this very nice argument that I laid out has been proven wrong, uh, since at least one very important state, the United States, is now in fact taking UAPs seriously. And a UAP science is slowly being grown, um, even at places like this conference. Uh, moreover, not only does the Pentagon now admit that UAP exists, but they've also said that they are a potential national security threat, a phrase that was repeated many times in different forms in the recent congressional hearings. So it's an amazing turnabout from the past seven decades. Now, obviously, I'm very happy to be proven wrong that states can't take UFOs seriously. However, I am an academic, and academics' first instinct when their pet theory is challenged is usually to double down and defend its continuing relevance. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do today. And in particular, I'm gonna argue that UAP science could be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it might answer one of the most profound questions that humanity faces today, namely, are we alone? And it might even answer it in the negative, which would be a good thing, presumably. Um, and yet, on the other hand, try answering that question could also provoke an equally profound political legitimacy crisis for the modern state the very thing that the UFO, UFO taboo was designed to prevent. Um, so from this perspective, a UAP science could produce a kind of dangerous knowledge, such that it's not just the UAP themselves that are a potential national security threat, as the Pentagon says, but even a UAP science that's a potential national security threat, because it might reveal a fact about which we are otherwise blissfully ignorant. So the theme of the talk really is be careful what you wish for and take pr appropriate precautions along the way. Now, the talk has two main parts. First, I'll be discussing UAP versus SETI science and through the first third of the talk. And in the second two thirds, I'm gonna move on to considering the issue, what exact, what kind of threat exactly are these UAP according to the Pentagon or who anybody who thinks about the issue. And then I'll conclude with a few questions at the end for sort of what, um, UAP science and UAP policy going forward, some questions that we might want to consider. So next slide, please. Okay, and then next slide again. All right. Um, so the threat, so to speak, of UAP science is that it might actually succeed and discover ETs in our neighborhood. And whether they're merely discovered um, without any contact or they're actually contacted, either way, such a success would introduce into our world, in a sense, in our worldview, an entirely new, basically superhuman subjectivity or superhuman intelligence, and obviously potentially change society forever. But how big a threat would this really be? I wanna discuss two considerations here. One is distance, and the other then is exactly the nature of the threat. Next slide, please. So, as we all know, the SETI community for decades has debated the potential consequences of either discovering or contacting ETs around distant stars. The consensus seems to be, as I read it, um, that the potential benefits to humanity of such a search uh, could be great, while the downside risk is very small. And that's mainly because the SETI literature has always assumed that contact with ETs would only occur over vast interstellar distances and thus be very slow and probably very non-threatening. It's true that Stephen Hawking famously warned against messaging ETs on the grounds that it might reveal our location to a predatory alien species. However, the constraints of distance are still there. And indeed, the Pentagon did not agree with Professor Hawking. To my knowledge, the Pentagon has never once worried about SETI discovering ETs 
around distant stars and that that would somehow be a national security threat. So it's a safe science in that sense. It's science, but it's a safe science. Next slide, please. In contrast to the long and vigorous debate in the SETI community about these issues, there has been almost no serious discussion about the consequences of a successful UAP science, or at least in English. There's actually a very interesting looking German book. It's going back to Hakan's point, um, but it hasn't been translated yet. But in English, there's almost no serious discussion of these issues, except perhaps in the Pentagon or deep in the bowels of the deep state somewhere. Okay. However, intuitive, even though there's no discussion, intuitively, it seems kind of obvious that an up-close discovery or, and or contact with ETs would be a completely different animal than discovering or contacting ETs around distant stars, as in the SETI scenario. And not only a different animal, but a much, much more dangerous animal, precisely because the distance that protects us in the SETI world is evaporated in the UAP world. And compounding that abstract or theoretical concern is a much more tangible concern that's evident in the Navy videos and presumably other evidence for UAP, which the Pentagon seems to think involves what they're calling so-called breakthrough technologies. These technologies, if that's what they are, uh, seem to defy the laws of physics as we know them, and as such are vastly superior to anything that the US military or probably any other military has in its inventory. Thus, if such technologies are uh, had or acquired by our adversaries, quote unquote, as suggested repeatedly in the congressional hearings, then from a national security standpoint, UAP are quite concerning indeed. So it makes perfect sense. And indeed, the technological gap between us and them is so great that if there were ever a conflict or a war with UAP or ETs, in my view, we would, we would be utterly helpless and have no chance of fighting back successfully. Um, and in that sense, we intrinsic, objectively here, there's some possibility of annihilation or extinction, independence based style. So in pursuing or doing UAP science, if it's successful, we might come face to face for the first time with an almost unimaginable power, the power literally of gods compared to us. And in the face of such immense power, it's no surprise that the US government, and this is a jargon term from my field of international relations or IR, it's no surprise that the US government has securitized UAPs, which is to say that instead of treating them as simply a scientific question, they're treating them now also as a national security issue. And that allows them to do various things. You can get more money that way and everything else. So securitization is what's going on or has just begun and we'll see if that continues. But the bottom line here is that messing with UAP could end very badly for us, at least potentially. This is not Cortez versus Montezuma here. It's human beings versus mice or even something lower than mice is my sense anyway. So in sum, if a UAP science succeeds in its goal, then it could change the world in a way that SETI never could. And in particular, it could reveal profound dangers that we never knew were there before. So dangerous knowledge in that sense. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this is where the, my outline is a little bit different than what you're gonna see. So everybody's kind of going back and forth here. But so I wanna talk first of all about, so what kind of threat are, what kind of security threat are UAP? Um, precisely. And, and what are they a threat to? Okay. The Pentagon report, um, and especially the congressional hearings, is full of warnings and references to national security threats from our adversaries. But nowhere are these adversaries named, or even the nature of the actual threat that they pose, nowhere is it made explicit. No one's talking about alien invasion or anything like that. So this is kind of surprising from a political science point of view. On the one hand, we're securitizing these things, without explanation on the other hand, okay? So in the rest of my talk, what I wanna do is kind of shift to my second agenda, which is to focus on the threat posed by UAPs themselves as opposed to UAP science. And I want to suggest that the threat here is not what it might seem, or it's not a Hollywood threat, um, and that the threat is not really UAP, but it's our reaction to UAP that's the danger. So the thesis really here, or the subtext of my argument is, 
the, the threat here is not them, whoever they are. The threat is really us and how we are thinking about and reacting to whatever we happen to discover through UAP science. And what this comes down to, I think, is the meaning of national security and how we think about it, what it means to be secure as a country or as a species. And in my field of IR, there are really these days two different ways to think about the meaning of the term security. And what I'm gonna do is briefly contrast those two meanings um, with the UAP example. And then I'm gonna go into more detail on the second of the two meanings. So let's go to the next slide. Let's see, what have we got? Um, okay, that's good, all right. Um, so traditionally in IR, the security of the state, national security was thought about very much as analogous to the physical security or safety of individual bodies. So security of the state is really about protecting the life of the state, the life of the body politic from conquest or elimination by other states typically. Basically the idea of security here is don't get killed. If you're not gonna get killed, then you're at least relatively secure, okay? And importantly, on this view of security, and this is often called a realist view of security, at least in my field, on this view of security, um, threats will usually come from outside the state. They'll usually come from other states in the system or transnational terrorists, um, you know, various things like that that are coming from outside the borders and are attacking the state, so to speak. Now, the Pentagon report never actually defines security or what a security threat is, but to me as an IR person reading the report, it reads very much like straight ahead realism it's a very traditional way of thinking about security. Um, the national security threat here is a physical threat. And the reason I say that is because the emphasis in the report and in the hearings is all on the technology, the breakthrough technology, which potentially can do us harm. And so it's really a physical kind of model of what our security depends on. But who are these adversaries? Um, in the congressional hearings, the subtext, we've got a honking horn in the background. I hope you guys can't hear that. In the congressional hearings, the subtext is that the adversaries really are Russia or China. But with all due respect, I think that's absurd. If the Tic Tac video is from 2004. If the Russians have that anti-gravity technology, they wouldn't be getting their butts kicked in the Ukraine. And China would have conquered Taiwan a long time ago and probably Hawaii too. So I think the chance of Russia or China being behind UAP is almost zero. Um, now, as for potential ETs, so far at least, there is zero evidence that they mean us any harm at all. And they've had 75 years to attack us, so, and they've done nothing. So at worst, I would conclude, um, any ETs that are present are either indifferent to us, they just don't care, or maybe they're curious, maybe play, seem playful sometimes, um, and or they're looking to make friends perhaps in the long run. So in securitizing UAP, the Pentagon is really making a worst case assumption. It's basically, it's all based on these breakthrough technologies and all the bad things that can happen if our adversaries get those. But they don't have to securitize these things. They could just treat them as a scientific problem. They could scientize them instead of securitize them. <coughs> but again, securitization has advantages. We can get research funding and Securitization allows the government, the state, to treat these cases in secrecy, to put them into classified category and then the public doesn't have to see them. You couldn't do that if it was purely a scientific question. Now, of course, worst case thinking is what militaries generally do, that's their job, okay? So I'm not criticizing the military for its strategy here and they're supposed to plan for the worst in kind of a precautionary mode of thinking. But again, there is no evidence at all the UAP act, actually pose any kind of physical threat to the US or any other state around the world. So objectively, it seems very unlikely that there is actually any kind of physical threat here. Any more than Britain, which has 500 nuclear weapons, is a threat to America. They're not because the British are our friends and so they're not a threat. North Korea, on the other hand, maybe they have five nukes, they're a threat because of, not because of capabilities themselves, but because of their intentions. So from this point of view, if there really is no physical security threat, then securitizing might actually be counterproductive because what it might do is encourage governments, if other governments securitize, or even non-governmental agencies, it might encourage different kinds of actors to try to shoot a UAP down, fire on one, 
Now, it doesn't look like they're easily shot down, but it might make them mad. And I'm not sure that's a good idea before we know what these things are. So uh, next slide, please. OK, actually, this looks like the new talk. So managed, we managed to get this worked out. So in IR scholarship, there is actually a second way of thinking about security. It's more recent, but it's gotten a lot of traction. Um, and a second way of thinking about what gets threatened in a security threat. And what's interesting about this kind of security is that this kind of security can be threatened even if UAP or ETs are friendly. They don't have to be enemies to threaten us here. They could be really friendly and it could still be a threat. And I think this is what's most interesting and what's the most concerning aspect of the whole UAP problem from my perspective. And this second way of thinking about security is called ontological security or sometimes just onto security for short. Now, of course, ontology is the study of being, but don't be put off by the jargon here. The idea of onto security is actually very simple and very powerful, namely, People will fight and people will die voluntarily to protect not only their bodies to keep from being killed by somebody else, they will also fight and die to protect their identities, their conception of themselves and of who we are. And th these conceptions of self and other and identity, these are things that need to be relatively stable on a day-to-day -day basis or human beings can't function. And so onto security is all about how do you stabilize identities? How do you stabilize a sense of self uh, and so on? So you might think of it, to avoid the jargon perhaps, as a kind of existential security, but not a security of the body. It's more like the security of the soul. Okay? And this kind of security can be threatened even if there is no physical danger. So think about the culture wars in America. I would say those culture wars are all about onto security issues on both sides. Okay? Or think about the war in Ukraine. Russia is a physical threat to Ukraine. They're trying to conquer the country, or at least a chunk of it. Ukraine, on the other hand, I think is really an ontological security threat to Russia. They're not a physical threat to Russia, they're way weaker. But ontologically speaking, Ukraine represents a democratic free society that is attractive to its own people. And that might be an attractive model to Russians who don't like dictatorship. So Putin basically has to kill Ukrainian freedom um, in order to avoid a threat to his own country, even though there's no physical threat from Ukraine at all. Um, so again, UAP could be ontologically threatening even if um, they are friendly as opposed to uh, hostile. And they can also come from within as opposed from, from without, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Okay, so one last point on this issue. <coughs> And that is that sort of onto security concerns, especially with UAP, would play out on two different levels. One level it would be the level of individuals. So imagine the announcement in 20 years that UAP might be ETs. I think you would almost immediately have seven or by then eight billion people will start wondering individually what that means for their religion, their ideology, their economic well being wondering about everything, questioning everything that we knew, thought we knew, that we could always take for granted, will suddenly, I think, be unsettled by this kind of a discovery. Putting it a different way, actually seeing or being made aware of this announcement would be a, an ontological shock, I think, to humanity as a whole, which could generate massive ontological insecurity and even collective trauma. Many of you may have seen Jim Carrey's movie, The Truman Show, came out, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, who discovers that his whole life was actually a TV show that everyone else was watching. Okay. And it's, of course, very upsetting when he finally discovers this. And there's a happy ending and all that, but it is an interesting analogy, which I think works well. So that's kind of the individual level that this issue works. But there's also a level of onto security issues with states because of course the contemporary world is divided up into 200 or so sovereign states and each of them wants to survive and remain stable and have its same identity and continuity and everything. So these states also have onto security needs and they're trying to protect themselves. And in the rest of my talk, what I wanna suggest is that the modern state in particular is almost uniquely vulnerable to an onto security threat from UAP. So vulnerable in fact, 
that a, conf a conf confirmation that UAP are ETs, I think, could lead to a collapse of the modern state and a breakdown of global order. Now, that's a worst case analysis. That's what I'll be doing here. Um, but unlike the Pentagon's pessimism, which I don't think is really justified, I think my pessimism has some basis. So it's the news in a sense is worse. But either way, I would say this worst case scenario deserves more attention than it's gotten. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, and so for the reason for this danger, I want to suggest um, is that the modern state and the modern world order is deeply anthropocentric. All right, uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna talk about this in two pieces. And the first of these is the social contract. And this is, you all familiar with this from Political Science 101. Okay, so consider first the founding myth about the modern state, which is that it is founded on a social contract between rulers or the state and the ruled, that's us citizens. In this contract or deal, the citizens agree to give up certain natural rights, like the right to use guns to settle personal disputes or the right to disobey laws. We give up those rights. Um, and in exchange for giving up those rights to the state, we receive two promises from the state. Namely, first, externally speaking, we, have the, we get the promise of protection from outside security threats, whether physical or onto, okay? And that would include presumably hostile ETs. So the state implicitly in our contract with the state promises to ward off any ET invasion. And internally, a second promise though, and I think this is the more interesting one, the state promises to protect us from each other, from our fellow citizens who might become criminals, vigilantes or whatever else, people who might want to harm us. And the state's job is to prevent that as much as it can. Now, according to the idea of the social contract, at least in liberal thinking going back several centuries, without such a deal, without such a contract, states could not survive and maintain order domestically. As Thomas Hobbes famously put it, if the state is not there to kind of guarantee order, then what you end up with is a state of nature, the animal kingdom where, quote, life is nasty, brutish, and short. And so that's the alternative to having a world of states in kind of a mainstream political science world. Okay. But the important thing here, I think, is that the social contract provides social cohesion. It pulls people together and helps them stay organized with a stable identity under one state. And so in that sense, the social contract is really the justification. It's the normative justification for having a state at all and for its power over us because of the things it provides us in exchange for what we give it to them. OK, uh, next slide, please. So the problem with all this in the UAP context is that it assumes that human beings are the only relevant actors in the political process. And therefore the human beings have 100% sovereignty over ourselves and the planet and so on. And so as Aristotle said, man is the political animal, not a political animal. So in, in mankind, at least in modern times, certainly um, it's, it's very much about people. And more precisely, the social contract is anthropocentric in two ways. <coughs> it assumes that human beings are the most important fact about the world. And it assumes, secondly, that human beings are the measure of all value, the more normative question, not a factual question, but a normative one. So it's a very narcissistic worldview. And despite the fact that if you look around globally today and you look at politics globally, you see tremendous variation across countries and government forms and the way that politics plays out, huge variation. But one thing that's common to all polities worldwide today is anthropocentrism, which is universally accepted at the political level. In effect, in the modern common sense, I think most people would say there's no alternative to anthropocentric or human rule. Because what would that be? Rule by animals and so on. So, there's no alternative, I think, in the mindset of most people. And that fact, the absence of an alternative to human rule, to the state rule, gives states immense power to mobilize their own people for political projects, like invading Ukraine, for example. The problem, of course, though, is that this the legitimacy and political force of this narrative of the social contract <laughs> of who we are 
is threatened, I would say, by the possibility that UAP are ETs, which is kind of the point of my 08 article. If that possibility is confirmed by Avi Loeb or UAP science more generally, even by governments, then it will quickly become obvious that the social contract that we've been living with is completely hollow. First of all, it's a territorial contract, which creates 200 separate sovereign states. Um, and the point of the national of, of the but what is the point of the nation state when the threat of ETs is to all states? They're not threatening just the if they threaten anybody, not just threatening the US or just Canada, they're threatening everybody. So from that perspective, the whole category of national security as a way of thinking about this issue is obsolete. So that's an initial problem. But more deeply, the contract itself is hollow. Uh, in the sense that states cannot protect us. They cannot claim to protect us physically against a potential external alien invasion. Um, indeed, it would, I think that if ETs were discovered in the atmosphere here or in the ocean or wherever, it would be immediately clear that it's the, the people who have ultimate sovereignty on earth are not people or states, it's ETs that have sovereignty over earth. Earth is their planet not ours, and we rule only at their pleasure. And if that's the actual what's going on, it raises the question for citizens, well, why should I abide my state? They're not even really in charge. They rule only at the discretion of these aliens and so on. Maybe a world state, but obeying my national state, that just seems kind of silly because my national state essentially is impotent. Okay, all right, next slide, please. All right, um, so imagine in 20 years that we have this confirmation that UAP are ETs with or without contact, how would people react to that news? It's not like discovering ETs in the SETI scenario very far away. This is up close where the immense power of ETs is on full display. The unimaginably immense power is on full display. I think many people, if that happened, would say it's the end of the world as we know it. And I think they would be right in a certain sense, although there can be different ends. So there's no single end of the world here. I don't really have time for a proper discussion of this. And this is actually, I'm thinking about writing a short book, developing this argument, but I can give you the brief outline here for a few minutes and that'll be sufficient to generate any questions you might have. Um, but I'm, the way I'm thinking about this is to think about under what conditions would states, how do you get failed states, what we call failed states? How does the state collapse and lose its legitimacy and it lose its grip on people? And I would say that if UAPs come along, whether discovered or contacted either way, they would uh, create or generate three very powerful emotions worldwide. And all three of these emotions in different ways, I would argue will subvert or undermine cohesion, group cohesion, the cohesion of the state, and therefore the internal legitimacy of the state as well would be at risk. So next slide, please. So the first of these emotions, very briefly, let's say greed. Assume that 1% of all the people who hear about the, hear the news decide, you know, the world is ending in a few months or a few years. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to engage on a crime spree, looting, do all kinds of bad things, and go out with a bang. All right, so you've got people messing things up and getting disorderly because the end of the world is here and you may as well party. Next slide, please. The more primary response I would guess would be fear and, or what in the SETI literature is sometimes called panic. And in this case, it's not just fear for our lives, the physical threat, it's really fear for our future, a fear for the nature of our world that we have all grown up on and that we're all attached to and we all want to preserve, or at least many of us do. Um, so it's, I think a potential loss of confidence in the future is really the, the key thing with fear. Stock markets, I mean, if their aliens show up, it's hard to imagine the stock market prospering from that. Um, and I think you might also have a loss of confidence in our fellow citizens, because as apocalyptic thinking increases, you're going to have more people saying, you know, I'm heading to the mountains with my guns to mount an armed resistance, unauthorized armed resistance against these aliens who are definitely coming. Or you might have people who don't go to the mountains, they stay in town, but they start acting like vigilantes to make sure the ETs do not infiltrate our society in human skins 
as is sometimes suggested in internet conspiracies. Okay, so you can imagine all kinds of craziness coming from the internet, motivating people to do a lot of weird things that are hard to control. Third, the next slide, please. Then finally, and to me, this is the most interesting reaction because it's not something that's usually talked about, um, but ironically, it is also a kind of threat to the state. And namely, if ETs are confirmed, then many people might be drawn to them, drawn to them in the sense of wanting to learn from them or even to be saved from them, either in a medical sense or a spiritual sense. <coughs> so the potential here is for the rise of a naturalistic UFO religion where ETs are worshiped as gods and people are hoping and praying that they'll come down and save them. And like fear and greed though, this could also reduce loyalty to the state because it would encourage people to ignore the state as irrelevant. I mean, who cares about the state if you're trying to get salvation from aliens who are here, right? Um, and because the state is morally compromised. For 75 years, they've been lying to everybody and now suddenly we're supposed to be on their side. So it's, anyway. Um, so I think that actually the wonder reaction would feed into greed and fear and, and create a spiral, potential spiral of falling cohesion, rising civil strife and violence, and ultimately either the collapse of the state or the imposition of martial law. Either way, politics would be changed, I think, forever. Uh, next slide, please. Conclusion, okay. So I've painted an apocalyptic scenario here, which hopefully will never come true, and I, who knows how likely it is, nobody knows. But I do think it's a possibility that needs to be taken seriously. And from this point of view, the UFO taboo for the past 75 years, which I've been railing against for 20 years myself, actually looks a little better because it protected us from a potential truth that humanity is not ready to handle. Remember the movie A Few Good Men and Jack Nicholson is, you know, the, the military commander and says, you can't handle the truth. Well, that's kind of the situation I see us as being in right now. So in effect, from this perspective, the UFO taboo was what Plato called a noble lie, a lie told by the authorities that keeps us all in ignorant bliss and also helps the state survive because if they reveal that this is a lie, that's a problem of legitimacy. So by implication, therefore, a UAP science, by being a threat to ignorance, is also a threat to anthropocentric politics, hence the idea of a dangerous knowledge. And indeed, um, I would say that UAP science is not just a science for these reasons, or for these reasons, it is not just a science, but a UAP science is also an inherently political silence, science, because if it succeeds, it will change the world completely. And so in a sense, it's what social scientists would call a critical theory. If you make it true, if you discover something and it becomes true, then the whole world changes. So it's a political science as well as a science. Now, for me personally, that's not a problem. Um, I've been arguing against the taboo for 20 years, and I think the risks of going forward with UAP science far outweigh the, the potential dangers anyway. But at the same time, I am very worried, much more worried than I see in the literature anyway, about the human reaction to any kind of confirmation that UAP are, or even suggestion that UAP are actually ET spacecraft. I think our civilization is very fragile. The anthropocentric basis of it is very vulnerable to strong counterexamples that will blow everybody's mind. So I think you know, we're in a very precarious situation, sort of on the edge of contact here, kind of clueless and not really understanding or thinking through what we're doing. Okay, We're just marching ahead with the science and that's great, but let's think about the politics here at the same time. So by way of conclusion, let me just very quickly rattle off five areas where I would say we need to think about some hard questions. The first is how much secrecy is warranted in the UAP area? I'm struck by the fact that neither in the report nor in the hearings did anybody offer a justification for keeping all these things secret, except that we don't want the Russians and Chinese to see what technology we have. I think that's a cover for the real issue because the Russians and Chinese know what we can do and we know what they can do. So I just don't, I think that's kind of a, a red herring. But so how much secrecy is justified and is any justified? And why is it justified? So that's a big question. Secondly, should UAP science and policy be internationalized at the global level 
or conducted by 200 separate states, which is what we're doing now. Or should it be done by a world state or some kind of international consortium or whatever? The, I think the case for internationalization is very strong because what if 199 states want to be peaceful, but one state, let's say North Korea, decides we want to attack UAPs. We're going to send some missiles at them or something like that. I think, so that's my third implication here, or third area of study, which is um, should we attack UAPs or try to shoot one down? Probably not. But what do we do if somebody does try to do that? We need some kind of mechanism to prevent that from happening if we don't want to be shooting at them. Uh, again, we may not be able to shoot one down, but it might make them mad. So the issue of aggression toward UAP, I think, is raised by this framework as well. Fourth, should the authorities or someone prepare the public, the global public, for a possible discovery of local ETs? And if so, how should we prepare them? Or alternatively, should we not prepare the public? Because that kind of preparation would be necessarily very centralized. And I can imagine all kinds of conspiracy theories being generated around the fact that the government is trying to prepare us for ET contact, right? That's a, it's a setup for conspiracy thinking. Okay, so that's complicated. Do we prepare them or not? If we don't prepare them, then we're going to remain ignorant, and then we're going to be more surprised if the news um, is positive. And finally, last question, implicit in all these questions, I would say, is kind of a larger normative question, which is who actually owns UAP? States? Deep states, militaries, scientists, um, or are they the common patrimony of all individual human beings? I don't know the answers to any of these five questions, but I feel like we should begin talking about them before it's too late. So thank you, and I look forward to your reactions. Thank you, Alex. Those are very deep and profound questions that I'm going to be pondering for quite some time, maybe even another 58 years. Um, uh, let me uh, begin by asking you a few questions, but first let me also tell you that there's a, and these are for the people in the room, there's a lot of people that are going back and having social interactions in the back of the room. Uh, I would just encourage you to be as quiet as you possibly can because there are some people that are having distracted, being distracted from hearing what's going on. Uh, so just be sensitive. We're all sitting here relatively close to each other, so it's, it's a tight-knit group. And uh, anyway, people are hearing that, so thank you if you would. All right, so uh, Alex, let me ask you with the first question here. Uh, do we ask white mice and lab rats for permission or their input to experiment? This assumes that humans at the top where are at the top of the food chain. Well, we have the feedback loops. I'm wrestling with my own voice here. Um, uh, no, we don't ask people. Well, no, we don't ask mice, obviously. Um, and if alien abductions are actually true, then the aliens are not asking us for permission either. Um, you know, I'm kind of agnostic on that issue, but um, you know, it's not surprising that we wouldn't be asked, though. We're just compared to any alien intelligence here. We're basically nothing. Uh, okay, I know that there's a feedback loop there that's going on. Uh, if you have Hoova up, is that what you have, Hoova up? Me? Yes. Yes, I have Hoova up, yes. Uh, I'm thinking that that might be it. If you could stop Hoova, that would stop probably that whole thing. You, you, you got into Zoom, and you should have Zoom up. Me? Well, I see Zoom right now. That's what I see up. But Hoover might be in your background. But anyway, I just let me go ahead and ask the next question here, if we can uh, do that. Uh, what do you think could be acted on now that could possibly mitigate or prevent the, the potential chaos that you've suggested? Well, that's a good question. And um, I think one thing we should do is the process should be slow. I mean, I'm all for rushing in on the one hand, but we've got to move slowly so that people don't, so that the science does not get too far out in front of where people are. Um, and I think there needs to start being a discussion in schools. Like I taught a class last this past semester for the first time on UFOs and national security. And it was great fun. The students loved it. Really interesting discussions. And I think colleges need to be teaching this stuff. And we need to have a, a discussion in the public sphere more generally. We need more media commentary. 
Uh, we just need a more serious discussion with more people weighing in and saying, hey, this is stuff we need to talk about. So that's, I think, in the short run, the best we can do. But that'll be a big start, I think. Okay. Based on us not being wiped out yet, how do we ascertain, number one, indifference, number two, a timing issue of scouting before aggression. 75 years is a lot of us, uh, uh, maybe a blink of an eye to them. Not being wiped out yet. Um, that was the end of the question? I guess that was not really a question, but it was more like a statement. Hard to tell what their intentions, if, assuming that they're ETs here, right? that's a big assumption, right? Um, they might be totally indifferent. My own sense is from the way in which they play with pilots and kind of are kind of teasing pilots repeatedly, I think they're trying to get our attention. Um, so I don't think, in fact, they're indifferent. I, my guess is they're looking to make contact down the road. Um, but at least for now, they're just trying to get our attention. In terms of timing before aggression, it is possible that um, it's just taken too long. My own guess though is they've been here much longer than 75 years. And especially if they're entering the ocean and coming out of the ocean, that suggests a much longer term presence. Um, so I, I guess I'm relatively skeptical that they're just scouting us out and building up and getting ready to attack. If that happens, of course, we're toast, the game is over and doesn't really matter. But I, I do think, I'm not, I actually think trying to prepare for that might even be counterproductive and not a good use for resources given that if we do get attacked, um, I think our cause is probably hopeless. How would you advise groups like SCU to tread considering the threat that you're outlining um, as they begin to continue to do open scientific research on UAPs? Well, I mean, I, I would like to see the research continued and I can imagine some people, if they agree with me saying, we don't want to do this, it's a bad idea. Many people may actually prefer to be ignorant. So that's a debate we need to have. Actually, we're not, we're, no one's debating whether to have UAP science. We didn't debate not having it before. And now in a sense, we're not debating whether to have it. So, um, so I've forgotten the rest of the question now. So I'm gonna pause right there. Okay. Is there a military threat in the fact that state powers are trying to develop technology to emulate UAP technology regardless of UAP intent? I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that part of the military's interest in these things is the idea of reverse engineering whatever they're finding and then being able to use it against the Chinese or the Russians. I think, though, that's very naive. The technology is probably so far advanced that it may take hundreds of years for us to figure it out. And plus, why would you use it against the Russians or the Chinese, or why would they use it against us? I think that's very anthropocentric thinking. It's very old-fashioned thinking. It could happen, but I'm, I'm skeptical that that's really how people will think about it. It is not hard to imagine uh, a civilization based completely on the assumption that we are alone, disintegrating into all kinds of bad things. But since when is human civilization based completely on the assumption that we are alone, I don't think that even tr that's even true in 5,000, 2,000, or 200 years ago. The latest poll numbers show that 80% think that we are not alone, don't they? Maybe I'm off. Okay, that's interesting. Well, a couple issues there. I mean, um, I mean, in ancient times, I would say, sovereignty was not nearly as anthropocentric because people believed either that the gods were actually walking around on earth doing stuff, or they believed that nature somehow had sovereignty and they were part of nature and they saw nature as having, in a sense, some kind of rule over us. So in the past, I would say we were not alone in the human mind as much as we are now. But of course, the alone, the non-aloneness here was with plants and God, okay, not with aliens. So nowadays, of course, the question is, are we alone vis-a-vis -vis aliens? And many people, of course, believe we're not alone. Of course, there's two questions really, are we alone and they're far away or we're not alone and they're up close? So that's a big difference. Um, but my own feeling is that simply believing that we're not alone or even thinking that aliens are here by itself um, is different than actually having it be confirmed and in some sense experiencing what that world would be like. I think even the most religious people in the world who you know, believe in God in the most fundamental ways if God actually materialized in a physical way on the planet, I think everybody would be blown away, even the deepest believers, because they would actually experience it and not just believe it in their heads. And likewise with ETs. 
It's one thing to believe in ETs and think they're here. Oh yeah, they're probably here. It's another thing, if they land and they show up, um, I think people are just gonna, they're gonna be in shock, total, total shock. And you'll have all kinds of reactions to that, which are very hard to predict. But again, I, I'm just kind of spouting off, but this is kind of my intuitions anyway. Given a hypothesis that the human species will eventually become distinct or extinct, do you believe it's more likely that an advanced civilization would cause our extinction or that we'd basically cause our own extinction, the latter especially in view of the fact that humans have already used nuclear weapons in war and we are currently have one in, in country threatening to use them again? Well, I do think that there is, um, and part of, and I was part of buried in the talk a bit, but part of the underlying idea that I have is that the real threat is from each other and not from the aliens. The aliens don't mean us any harm, and if anything, they want to help. But we may be our own worst enemy because if we cannot handle the truth, so to speak, if that's what the truth is, then we're going to descend into fighting and chaos and war. And I think there's potential for, if not wiping ourselves out, at least destroying our current civilization and forcing us to start over again. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure what to make of that. I, I have toyed with the idea of, uh, in my, this book that I might, I might or may not write, that with the idea that human being, the people who discover that UAPs or ETs will be the last humans, because after that discovery, the world will be completely different. And whatever comes after that, whether biologically or socially, is going to be a new kind of human. So that may not be extinction, but it is the extinction of an anthropocentric worldview that dominates the system today and is arguably responsible for climate change and everything else. So it wouldn't be a bad thing in that respect. Um, do you think that the events of alien contact that seem to increase over time could be a conditioning process that might be there to help uh, maintain uh, some sort of uh, human condition or cohesion, if you would, when they do show up? Well, that's that's interesting. Um, do you think that the events of alien contact that seem to increase over time could okay. be a conditioning process? Yeah, no, I do think actually. I mean, I don't, I haven't read that many reports about pilots and so on. But my impression, though, of what pilots are encountering is exactly that. It's kind of a conditioning process because not only are our electronic and other technological sensors programmed not to see UAP. But pilots are trained not to see UAP. And if they do see them, well, they, got, they have to ignore them. So what's happening now is kind of a reconditioning, empowering pilots to make reports, whereas before it was discouraged, teaching pilots what to see, what to notice, how to approach these things, and so on. So I do think we're, the, the, the especially what I was reading about what happens off the East Coast with the, you know, the UAP come out every, every single day for two years, talking to the pilot, interacting with the pilots. I think that is a conditioning process, getting human beings to actually see what's in front of them, which we've been unable to do for all these decades. Some of us who've studied the phenomena for a long time have decided that instead of covering up ET disks, bodies, or underground bases, a much more likely cover-up is that the government knows the phenomena does involve real intelligences and objects, uh, but almost nothing else about the source. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a fascinating question, which is what is the deep state? I mean, I, I mean, it's interesting that one implication of this whole line of argument is that the people who actually have all the cases, who have the authority to release those cases, that's the deep state. And every country has a group like that, presumably in the bowels of its bureaucracy. So, um, wait, so wait, what was the question again? I'm sorry, go ahead, Rich, could you repeat? Um, it was just getting your thoughts on that idea in terms of the fact that the government probably knows a lot more than they're really telling you, and they, you know, they're not, uh, they're not just talking about the, the, they don't understand or not aware of what the source is. Yeah, no, I think the government clearly knows much more. Whether they, um, of course, the government is not a unitary body. It's presumably the people who have access to these cases. They may disagree among themselves about what the cases represent, um, but yes, they may know more. They may have a pretty good idea that these things are not human. I would guess they have a pretty good idea of that. If they don't have that idea, then I'm not sure what's going on. So in that sense, um, they may know more, but they don't have any idea what to do with it. So yes, and then that's, 
part of the secrecy. On the other hand, that may be good. Maybe they're telling a noble lie here and they're trying to protect us from the truth because if we're not ready to hear the truth, then all hell breaks loose. In the case of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that's going on, it's been going on for quite some time, uh, what do you think about the possibility that it could actually draw hostile aliens to the Earth? Well, it's always possible. Um, you know, there are arguments, as everybody here knows, that as any civilization that lasts long enough to be able to travel interstellar differences, distances will probably be nonviolent because if they're violent, they're likely to get destroyed. Um, but that's all very theoretical. Nobody really knows. Um, I think there is some chance of hostile aliens. On the other hand, what do we really have to offer? Why would they want to conquer us? They can just take whatever they want without killing anybody. So, and it does seem as if they have some kind of an, a Star Trek style prime directive of non-interference because um, they're not bothering us right now. Um, but again, I, no one can rule that out. And that's one more reason to actually be concerned about the UAP science, not to stop it. I mean, I think we need to keep it going obviously, but this is another potential risk that we're running. Should the soft sciences and political sciences be a key supporting component of the SCU's organizational strategy? Well, I think one of the things that I've really been struck by in all the publicity around Avi Loeb's initiative and a lot of the discussion that's happened the past year, I don't see social scientists anywhere on the horizon, or at least social scientists who are sort of regular practicing social scientists. Um, so I think that's a problem. I think this issue is not just a scientific issue. It is definitely that, obviously. But it's also a political and a social issue. And I think we've got to get people, you know, if not me, but other people involved in this so that we can start thinking the issues through. Um, do you see uh, do you see appreciation of social movement theory models to determine social reactions to UAP disclosure? Well, that's, that's interesting. I don't know much about the social movement literature. There's a whole academic literature on this. Um, and there's actually not just social movements, but one could imagine a lot of psychological research, social, sociological research on how people might react. Um, one of the papers I assigned in my seminar last uh, spring was a paper about how do people react to uh, panic and disasters, which was, you know, had nothing to do with UAP, but it was a fascinating discussion about panic in disaster situations. So I think there is a lot of literature that social scientists have already produced that at least indirectly speaks to these issues, but not in a direct way. So it's a matter of connecting the dots as much as anything, I think. Okay, well, another question here. What role do you see strategic security research taking to address the existential threat that UAP pose? Well, I mean, if, this, if the strategic thinking is about physical security and worrying about being attacked, well, that is sort of an important question. And I guess the military should worry about how they're going to deal with an invasion if that actually happened. Again, I think that's very unlikely. If the threat is ontological, though, that's a different kind of threat. And the military may not be able to deal with that. That may be a public relations issue. That may be a job for scientists or social scientists or whatever. So. Um, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Alex, uh, we're going to stop at that point because we're getting ready for uh, lunch right now. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we appreciate your flexibility and your, so, your, your willingness to uh, be patient while we work through the technical issues. And, uh, but uh, it did come out very well. We were able to hear what you had to say, your presentation. I think we'll work on it so that when you're joining us tomorrow virtually that you don't go through Hoover, but you'll just use the link. Uh, the Zoom link that we send to you again, okay? Uh, but we want to, let's have a big round of applause for Alex. Well, thank you very much for everybody. I think we'll work on it so that when you're joining us. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for being here. No, apparently not. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Rocket City Tavern for hosting the event. Uh, I, I'd just like to start with a, a few acknowledgments before we get into the, uh, the panel. I really appreciate all the speakers who have preceded me. Uh, I'm thrilled to hear Dr. Wentz's comments about political science and social science and the importance of those areas as part of the larger scientific strategy to technically understand UAP. I think as we go through the evolutions of understanding all of the nuanced dynamics of this very complex problem set, I think it's an imperative to also consider those soft sciences as part of the larger strategy because this, this ultimately involves societal aspects and public policy matters that we, we just can't ignore. So I want to thank the speakers, uh, all of you, for coming forward. It, it does take some, uh, some courage to step forward and speak openly about the topic. Uh, and I just want to extend my, uh, my thanks and appreciation to you all for, for the presentations that have come so far. I uh, would love to thank the friends, and you know who you are in the audience, who, when asked, made the trip and traveled down here. There are some, some people that I, I specifically asked if they'd come, and they did, and I want to just let you all know how uh, touched I am and how appreciative we all are that, that you did make the special trip. I'd like to thank the Hoffman family for their support uh, to Rich, because Rich is a, is a friend, and I know he couldn't do this without them. I'd also uh, like to thank my wife and my kids and my nieces are out, are out in the uh, audience helping out. So uh, just thank you all very much. Could not do it uh, without my wife and my, my daughters and, and my beautiful nieces. So thank you all. And uh, I'm going to get into uh, the topic shortly. I'm going to do a brief introdu introduction on our panel. Uh, the, the topic today, it's, it's not really a presentation. It's more of a discussion and an exchange of thoughts. It's the, the national security implications of scientifically studying UAP. We're, we're not really discussing the threat narrative. We're, we're just discussing the implications to national security by pursuing this topic from a, a non-emotional, a scientific perspective. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to introduce our panel members very quickly. You've all got their bios, but I just want to say uh, a few words about each of them. Mr. Rich Hoffman, uh, uh, he's got almost 60 years in this area as, a, as, as an investigator and as a thought leader. Uh, he was part of Project Blue Book uh, as a in an advisory role, and he brings uh, a wealth of knowledge in spectrum management, spectrum analysis, technical investigations, and, and IT, and we're very fortunate uh, to have him lead this event, and I'm, I'm very lucky and appreciative to have him on the panel. Uh, next is, is a man who, in my mind, needs no introduction, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway, Dr. Gary Nolan. Uh, a, a friend, uh, a professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford. Uh, he's known for the Atacama uh, study. Uh, amongst many other notable initiatives and projects, he is another thought leader in the scientific study of this topic and uh, considered uh, one of the preeminent subject matter experts in understanding the analytical process to examine metamaterials. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Josh Pearson. Uh, Josh is a 25 plus year strategic security professional. Uh, he is currently working on a doctoral dissertation specific to UAP. It's one of the first uh, I've seen of its kind and I, I think his work is going to be seminal to the topic. We're, we're thrilled to have him uh, and I, I think it's it's going to be a little bit enlightening today when he gets into some of the discussions about his, his particular study. And then last is a, another friend and colleague, Dr. Matt Shadegas. 
uh, professor at the State University of New York, the uh, one of the uh, key people that the SCU looks to for topics related to dark matter, and was recently uh, featured in the documentary A Tear in the Sky. Uh, I, I, I know Gary, Gary Voorhees is out here, so there he is, hey Gary. Uh, Gary and the team are out here with Dr. Travis Taylor and a few others, and it's an amazing piece of work. I encourage all of you uh, to take a look at it and please check it out. So if I, if I did miss anybody, please forgive me. And uh, with that, we're going to uh, get into the, uh, the discussion. So this is a panel conversation. I'm going to start with a question and lead into one of the subject matter experts here up, up in our panel, and they'll provide their thoughts their uh, perspective, and then the rest of the panel will be able to chime in with their own opinions. We'll, we'll go down the line, and uh, at the end of the event, we'll take, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. So the first question, and this pertains, I think, really to everybody in the room, it should be of interest because it, it'll, it'll resonate with, with everybody. It should, anyway. How would the scientific study of UAP potentially impact our intelligence collection platforms or strategies, and here's, here's a nuance. By understanding the manner in which the, the, the scientific study done in organizations like the SCU, uh, UAPX, and other technically oriented entities, when we can better inform our intelligence strategies from a technical collection perspective, there's always a cascading derivative of thought leadership and insight that trickles out into groups like UAPX and SCU, and vice versa in some cases. So this is a very thoughtful question that uh, I'd like Josh to lead off uh, in, in terms of providing some perspective. Again, it's how would the scientific study of UAP potentially impact our intelligence collection platforms or strategies? Dr. Pearson. I think that starts with understanding the purpose of intelligence analysis and intelligence collection. The purpose of intelligence collection and analysis is to identify a threat, to understand capabilities and intent of an adversary. And so the cascading effect would then put policymakers in a position to where they have to render judgment. And the difference between doing intelligence analysis vice scientific method style of technical collection and analysis of data to determine uh, varying hypotheses, when we're looking at the, in, at, at the problem set from an intelligence perspective, at the end of the research, with whatever you have, the analyst makes a judgment. And then that judgment is what becomes what the policymaker makes a decision off of. So when we talk about why is it that the, that, that the government or some other aspect may not be so forthright with, with certain parts of information? We really come down to two problems. One, uh, we, we discussed briefly yesterday derivative classification authority, which means that if you have a technical collection capability and you pull data off of that and uh, you, um, you start cataloging it, everything that comes off of that because of the source or method is what makes it classified. The information may not necessarily be classified, but the methodology collecting it is what makes it classified. And so now, the, the next step is once that is put into an intelligence report and then uh, validated and verified through structured analytic techniques and analytical tradecraft, the analyst makes a judgment and then that judgment goes forward to the policymaker. The decision that policymaker makes can have an effect that we don't necessarily understand. And so that's when we start getting into the gray zone and, and how it is we interact with, with uh, our friends, our allies, and even our adversaries is when we make that judgment, that now becomes a policy. And when that policy is in place, it's very hard to walk it back from that. And so if we start, if, if we scientifically uh, analyze UAP through technical collection means, and then we run it through an analytical judgment or an analytical process, it's going to lead to a policymaker making a judgment that can have an effect that we don't foresee. So which could be why part of the reason why we're met with a lot of resistance when we're trying to interact with governments to extrapolate data from them for us just to do analysis to determine uh, through the scientific method. So uh, Rich, do you have any, any comments to add to that? Yeah, I do. Um, 
One of the challenges I see with the whole collection process, and I've experienced this in other types of situations. For example, uh, and I know that UAPX will be glad to tell you that they took a lot of hours of data. The question is, how do you discern that data down to the point where you're actually looking and focusing on the one object or whatever that object is? Uh, and trying to now to do something. So, and so there's always been a data collection problem in a sense that you may have hundreds of thousands of hours of video or data or something like that when it actually happened at one spot, you know, or in that specific time. And if you put that then in a larger context in terms of, let's say, an entire carrier group with all the data that they can get, how do you get all that data synthesized to be able to give you something that's meaningful because it takes hours to analyze the data? So unless you have something like maybe AI or machine learning or something to help you to do those types of things, it's like then giving that to an intelligence analyst who's now going to be working with that uh, and deducing something from it. I, I see a lot of challenges with that. I work in the Army world and we try to get data you know, in one spot and we're, we're extremely difficult challenge. You have a general making decisions based upon information that's probably changed or old or various other things because it's not necessarily in real time. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think we've got a lot of work ahead with just the sheer volume of stuff. And I think that's already, you know, like Matt will be glad to tell you that he's creating algorithms to help him go through and sort through the data to try to find specific things that he can share and have somebody now look at, right? Um, so. That's uh, kind of like where I'm at with that whole data collection. But I think that, you know, obviously the process is once it does get into the intelligence world, that it is like he's talking about, you take that to le leaders and you help them to develop policies. Uh, Dr. Nolan, any uh, comments? Well, I, obviously I'm more of an academic than most of the other people up here. You know, I, I look at it from the standpoint of what we do in the cancer research that we do, where we're getting enormous volumes of, of novel information that we need to sort out and put together. And so I, I wonder how much a problem it is that the information is getting siloed and not shared with enough people who can bring in novel hypotheses. Because once you come up with what you think is the way, it, be, it starts to become it's, it, it becomes the niche exploitation problem. Somebody, somebody has stead, started and said, this is the way we do it, and then other ways are not considered. So how do you allow for uh, advancement of the technologies that you're using to investigate the problem and also the algorithms before things become set in stone? And so, because that's going to lead to interpretation problems if you limit yourself from the novel ways of thinking about it. And we're, that's the reason why we're all here. Right. right. We're all here because right. people have said, that, no, we're not going to even bother looking at this anymore. Right. Uh, Dr. Shadegas, any comments? Yes. So I'm in academia, and I agree with a great deal of what's been said, but especially by what uh, Dr. Nolan just said, is you have, a, um, you have to do a risk-benefit analysis, and I think a lot of um, damage is done by the classification system we have and the siloization, because you, then you don't have interdisciplinary outside-the-box thinking. And so then it's very, very hard to make progress. I have seen this also again and again in science where, there, where things aren't classified, but it just so happens that group A didn't talk to group B, and group B didn't realize group A had already solved the problem 30 years ago. But that's exacerbated when it's actually, you have, you have classification of information and people who might have had the answer to certain aspects of the phenomenon 10, 20, 30 years ago are not allowed to see the data. So what I always have been trying to uh, push for, it's one of the questions I asked last night, is why can't we just release all the you know, juiciest alleged images and videos and just scrub the uh, parts that would reveal the, you know, the classified technology, how the radar, the good cameras work? I've had absolutely no good answer to that question. It doesn't make any, any sense to me. You can scrub the sensitive information, just not say, oh, this was with the SPY-1 radar, or this was with this technology, but here's this you know, juicy piece of information. It's better than, it's better than nothing, and I think it would be, and it'd be better, much better than, um, than what we have now. I appreciate it, Matt. I think one of the key, uh, key themes that comes out of this conversation is the need for collaboration and sharing of information across non-governmental organizations like the SCU and UAPX, which th thankfully I, 
think we're, we're working on a collaborative effort with UAPX to uh, share information and, and provide some, some synergies and, and uh, enable those relationships in a productive way. Uh, Dr. Pearson, I was wondering if you'd use this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about your, your doctoral work, your dissertation, and speaking uh, to some of your research. So I took a, I took a different stance than, um, first, I'm not a physical scientist or an astrophysicist by trade. I am a strategic security professional. It's where my whole life has been, it's been my life's work, is really addressing the very issues that we're talking about here, is how do we uh, work through the, the, the classified system to get out what needs to get out. And vice, what do we need to secure to make sure that we don't have our adversaries be aware of what it is that we have a capability for, right? So, so my dissertation focused on how do we, how would me as a strategic security professional look at this problem and what would I do to, to inform a policymaker or, or other uh, members of the intelligence and strategic security community of what they should look at uh, when they're attempting to, to you know, calibrate sensors, whatever the, the, the verbiage is that, that we're going with with the issue today. And so my research question was, uh, what are the measurable and detectable signatures that UAP present? Um, so I started with five off of uh, Lou Elizondo's show and said, this is gonna be our starting point. And as I went through the research process, which starts with the, you know, the intro where you define your, your, your research questions, you start addressing your criteria, and then you address the lit review. At the literature review is when I realized that five wasn't gonna be enough. And it increased to about 14. And, and these are, and, 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 uh, and, and I'm gonna get to what denoted measurable and detectable. At the end of it, after uh, um, completing chapter three and working through chapter four, which chapter four is not approved yet, so I'm still waiting on, on um, the committee to approve the research and to see if I need to go back and do more. So this is, so what I'm gonna say may have to go back and be relooked. but at this point, uh, I was able to analyze 100 cases within the time allotted, and what I, it grew to was 41. 41 signatures which are measurable and detectable. Now measurable and detectable in the strategic security field has a different connotation than in the scientific field because we put a lot of emphasis on the human sensor. And of the 100 reports that, that I reviewed, 99 originated from an eyewitness. F 41 of those were validated by some sort of technical collection aspect. Only one was a was, uh, collection was initiated by a radar. Now that's telling for me as a strategic security professional that although eyewitnesses can tend to, to uh, exaggerate thought processes or comments or, or, or maybe the data may not necessarily be trustworthy, it gives us a starting point to start to look at other means of detecting what the phenomena is and addressing it through a different aspect. And if we're able to use human sensors to, to identify areas where there could be clusters or saturation, then we can use a multimodal uh, mobile and deployable collection platform, much like what UAPX created, to dispatch and then collect on that area to either confirm or deny uh, what, it, it, what it is that's actually being reported. So that was probably the most interesting finding in my study was the, the role of the human sensor that we so often discount. Uh, the other aspect of that is, is of those, uh, uh, the, 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 the methodology behind assessing human sensor is I needed at least two sources. So at least two individuals had to see or observe the, the, the phenomena and, and render a, 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 um, a report that had some close characteristics. And again, some of these are very old. I went from 1940s all the way through to the 2000s. And so there are some gaps in that. And then what I did is I took it through a curation standard of is this something that uh, the national security community would be concerned about. And then worked it through there to get to roughly of those 100 cases, 60% came back with, some, with, with, a, with a, an established uh, a standard of trustworthiness, of credibility. And it's something that we can use as, as, a, as a guideline within the strategic security community to inform the scientific community to go, hey, check this area out. Because you all have the, have the capability to understand the, 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 the measurement and signatures uh, 
uh, aspects of the phenomena, which is not necessarily something that, that is within my wheelhouse, but is definitely something that we can inform to, to cue where we should look at. Josh, thanks for your, your comments and, and sharing. Rich, I, yeah, yet? I'd like to make a comment. Um, and that is that, and of course, I lived in the world of anecdotal records because, you know, when you were dealing with com without computers and technology back in 1964, 65, 66, it was all anecdotal, you know, and you'd have occasional crude drawings that people would make. And you, I've been out with 30 witnesses and all 30 drew different kinds of things that they saw, right? So that's, that's a challenge in this whole context of trying to get an understanding when you're getting the anecdotal brought in. And I'll, I'll also point out that, you know, when we dealt with the Aguadilla video, for example, you know, uh, that was a situation where we, we primarily focused on the video, uh, although the witnesses did, you know, give us some information, you know, that we were able to go with, but you're dealing with that, just that one segment of data, you know, if you would, the video, uh, and you tried to understand that. And that's where it's often a challenge. Uh, and uh, let me also point out to you that, that I, I think I told you before that we're installing at all the DOD locations these detection systems to allow us to see what's going on above our ranges and our perimeters. And in that context, this is a perfect opportunity if you think about wanting to collect intelligence about objects that the government's telling you that are coming on their ranges, right? That we're, here's the, where the, the disconnect is. We're putting these systems out, spending millions of dollars to do that just for the local people to be able to have the force protection people to run out and fix things. That ought to be going into the fact that if these are UAP, they ought to be going into that collection system you're talking about. So you're now benefiting from the data and the information you've got out there to do that, right? Uh, so. We've got to get together the intelligence piece of this, working with the fact that we're constantly fielding these kinds of systems and making sure that it is supplying the information that we want. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate that. The, the, clearly, there's a need for greater collaboration between private groups like the SCU and the government. There's, it's just a matter of finding the right mechanisms and venues to enable that, that type of synergy. Uh, on a, on a separate but so, sort of related note to Dr. Pearson's dissertation, thankfully we've got uh, Dr. Davis is on his committee and uh, has been a, a critical part of enabling the, uh, the level of quality coming, coming through his research. So Eric, thanks for all your support to Josh. Josh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just loop back to you uh, for a moment. Would you be able to talk about any one particular case out of, out of your study that stood out the most in terms of uh, the variety of signatures you were able to document and catalog, just to give the audience an understanding of the depth uh, you took to look at the human sensor as, as in essence, a collection platform? So there's two. Uh, well, really, three. Um, the 1953, I believe, the 1953 Haneda case with the, uh, the Navy uh, aircraft that had multiple phenomena uh, interacting, so what I, what I like to say, interacting with, with the aircraft. And then uh, the 2004 Nimitz case, of course, and of course, the 2014 and 15 Theodore Roosevelt case. All of them have had common signatures and common reporting across credible eyewitnesses and uh, through the data collection capability or the, the, excuse me, the technical collection capability that was present on, on those aircraft all indicated common, common signatures. So it's it, like we, we know that because we, you know, we, we live it in, in, in the UAP enterprise, in the, in the UAP world, like in the community. We understand that. But to, to be able to, to put that into a dissertation when, to my knowledge, the last dissertation published from a physical science perspective on UAP was 1969. Huh. After that, it was all psychology, parapsychology, social aspects of believing in UAP like it became its own religion. And so th this dissertation is, is now giving voice to, to, you know, what Gary Voorhees experienced, what what, what Ryan experienced, what, what all these individuals experienced, say, look, like, like this, 
This not only occurred here, but in 1953, and I might have the date wrong, and I apologize for that, we, we, we have an aircraft that actually uh, uh, both technically collected and had eyewitnesses reporting was uh, indicating using Morse code to communicate. At the same time, while uh, following the aircraft, uh, doing other interactive means with it, forcing it to do evasive maneuvers, which is a lot of some of the same, or a lot of the same signatures we saw with the 2004 case and with the 2014 and 15 case. So this isn't necessarily an issue that, that doesn't have longevity, nor it, it, that has, it, so we can't ignore the longevity of the issue and we can't ignore the transience of it. That it has happened in, two, in three distinctly different areas and environments where this has occurred and, and they have common signatures. And I can break some of those down if you'd please. like. Yeah, please. Um, so the, uh, the, the color of the object was the same. Uh, the, the, um, the report was orange and white from the Haneda incident. Uh, they reported orb. Uh, we have to give some license to, to pilots reporting from 1952. The mannerisms in which the interaction was occurring indicated what we call a tic-tac now. Um, the, uh, it was multiple UFOs. Uh, they didn't use the term reigning UFOs in, a, in, 19, in the 1950s, but that is something that they elaborated on. The, uh, the, um, the uh, phenomena was exhibiting action, was exhibiting a targeting capability, and was exhibiting some semblance of sentience, uh, in, in, which really redefines what it is we might be looking at. Now, again, from strategic security perspective, my starting point is I don't know and I'm not going to have and I'm not going to hypothesize about intent because if I don't have enough to verify intent, I can always use a target centric approach on signatures to determine capability. And then once I'm able to define capability, then I might be able to start looking at intent. And now it, it doesn't always have to be one or the other. Oftentimes they're concurrent and sometimes we start with intent and then we have to determine capability. But at this point, with what I've been looking at at this dissertation, is, is using the 1950s case and the two cases, the Nimitz and the, the Theodore Roosevelt case, is we're, we're able to, 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 to possibly assess, have a better assessment of capability over 70 years of, of time where this phenomena has been interacting with aircraft or even people or other objects and systems of systems that, that are out there. Matt, do you have something you want to add? Yeah, so I have a couple pent up points from the last couple of minutes. So one is on psychology and the human sensor. So even though um, my PhD is in, in physics, I've talked to um, colleagues, professors of psychology, and I was shocked to learn that um, there's no such thing as mass hallucination. It's made up, it's a myth. So I, I like the point about how like, you know, if you have two or more witnesses, that increases the, um, the probability, definitely. Because with one, if you don't have non-human sensor corroboration, it's very hard. But no one's answered um, uh, my challenge yet in the scientific community to psychologists, psychiatrists, and, and uh, neurologists. I'm like, sh can you show me a peer-reviewed scientific study that proves that two or more people can hallucinate the same thing at the same time? Because if you can, then you've proved telepathy, something else that doesn't you know, <laughs> exist allegedly. So I, I think that having multiple um, uh, credi credible witnesses is wonderful. You could still have, of course, there's always cases of one person of a uh, dominant personalities like do you see that right now but you're not gonna you can't transmit your uh, hallucination to somebody else the other aspect we talked about is the non-human sensor of course the sensor platforms like we had on um, UAPX we thought it was absolutely crazy that the congressional hearing um, made no mention of SCU made no mention of UAPX um, the Gillibrand amendment original wording was scrubbed that had mentioned SCU and Galileo project explicitly it's th they want to they say they want openness and want to learn but don't want to engage with the people who have already been doing this some of them like Rich have been doing this for decades and they don't want to learn what what intelligence we've already gathered and I think that um, that's a, d a disservice to the to the entire field can I also inject one thing, if please, I may? Um, so you're all sitting here in Huntsville, Alabama. In October 12th of 2012, there was an object that was seen taking off from this base, and it was heading north. And I had immediately phone calls from people saying around the city who knew that I was in it, 
calling, and I think three or, three or four people, and said, I, are you seeing this object that's, that's going up north? And I'm saying, no, I didn't. And, and so I, here I was, I was going into a meeting, and I decided that I was going to go in, and I'm looking up at the sky, and there was, it was a beautiful blue sky, there, there were puffy clouds going by and everything else, and I'm watching as this, this light would be on, and then it would be off, on and off. And it's just like that, right? The same, roughly in the same spot. And I'm going like, I'm thinking I'm seeing my first UFO, right? Yeah. Wow, I'm finally seeing one, right? And I even saw some people that were coming by and said, look up there, do you see that too? You know, and they were saying, what? You know, and it was a little dot up there. Next thing I know what happened is I have, and I got to work, and then somebody said, did you see that long cylinder that was up in the sky today? I'm going like, no, I didn't. What was it? You saw a cylinder that was up there? Really? And then the next day, because I was in MUFON and I, was this, I had the ability to go and look at the database. Over the next four days, this long thing moved all the way up to Canada. Along the way, there were like 40 reports of UFOs that were going on up and all the descriptions varied. It was a dot, it was an orb, it was a long thing, it was like this. But you could also look at the wind pattern that was going across the United States at the time and it took it right up that way. One gentleman in Kentucky had, uh, had a telescope and he had it brought up and sure enough, he took a good close up picture of it and it was a long cylinder with some little things on it. It was a Google Loon secret project that Google had to be able to bring internet to these different places, right? Okay, so, and they didn't tell you that for like another year. Okay, so turned out it was launched from here. It was using a NASA balloon that was launched and it had all these things and they were doing this test. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, going back to what I said about people's descriptions vary and the human challenge that we have that we get that information and why it is that you know, you're not hearing about those cases going back in the past that we're looking at, and you're hearing about the Nimitz going forward. It's because, guess what? You got the technology there now you're using to be able to get things that are better, that will help these people and help all of us get a better understanding of these objects. When we did the Aguadilla kind of case or something like that, it was the first time we had a chance to see something in infrared. You know, it's like, there's not a whole lot of those. And military-grade equipment, by the way. So it's like we paid millions of dollars for these things, and now we're getting, wow, this is incredible. So I just want to point out to you, as technology continues to morph on, we'll get better and better information. Of course, an example of good, uh, you know, what they're getting in UAPX with all the equipment, that'll be fabulous. But I just want to share with you that human challenge and how the interpretation can vary uh, uh, of that same object that was moving up through the skies from here. It's a great point, Rich. I think one of the key takeaways I'd offer is the importance of, and I'm going to say the word collection, even though this is a civilian organization, it's, it's critical to use technical means to gather your data in the field. But as equally as important uh, is an intelligence-driven approach. You've, you've got to understand, in my opinion, respectfully, I think it's critical that as we collect data technically, the way it's analyzed is, is uh, driven by doctrinal analytic tradecraft, if you will. And there's a lot of open source data. Uh, Josh mentioned the target-centric approach. There's a great book on it. I think it's Dr. It's Clark, Richard Dr. Clark. Clark. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's great methodology for analyzing data when collected via technical means. So I, I would encourage uh, for those in the audience, whether they're physically present or virtual, to consider that is that, yes, uh, we've got to do this scientifically. It's got to be done using technical methods. But the, uh, the analysis of the data really should be driven uh, from, from a process that's, that's doctrinally codified and consistent with best intelligence community practices. And that's, that's just my, my own perspective in my, in my role uh, as National Security Advisor for the SCU. So that's just, just some, some thoughts that I, I'd like to uh, share with everybody. But I think it's a, a great opportunity. 
Rich mentioned uh, the Aguadilla report. I encourage uh, everybody, to, if they haven't read it yet, please get on the SCU website, take a look at it. Uh, Josh, we're all excited for your, your dissertation to get published, no pressure. But uh, we're all excited to see your work uh, and, and get a feel for the different observations beyond the, uh, the established five that uh, you, uh, you found in your research. And uh, before I close out this, this uh, question, does anybody have any closing thoughts they want to share? No, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> I had to ask, I know everybody cringed when I did. But uh, moving on to the next, the next question. Uh, and this one's for, for Rich Hoffman. Uh, to start, yeah, to start. <laughs> how, how could these advancements in our efforts to understand UAP impact new research and development in the areas of spectrum analysis, spectrum warfare, secure communications, or cyber-related technologies? Wow. <laughs> uh, let me sum it up in two words. No, I, I wish I could. Uh, so... I guess how I want to address that one is, you know, number one, I'm kind of like the, this odd bird in the sense that I'm, I'm a ufologist within the military world, right? So uh, you know, that's kind of like a, you know, almost like an oxymoron isn't it, or something like that. But anyway, uh, but anyway, so the situation is that, uh, you know, the challenge is that I have, I've gained a better understanding of the need for national security uh, as I've now gotten into that field. And so I always walk the simple dance of like transparency versus, you know, the security concerns of keeping things. And how do you deal with the fact that there's a whole world out there of people who experience these things that also want to know about what you're learning, right? And then how far can I go with knowledge sharing? And when does it, when do you trip over that and you're now into some sort of cons security concern and everything else? Because, you know, th th that's it's always a delicate balance between the two. Uh, you know, and to me, it's always been one of these things where it's like, you know, literally over here at the arsenal, I mean, probably every minute there's at least 200 attempts to attack our IT systems by every country that's out there that wants to be a nasty adversary, right? And all these hackers. And we're constantly dealing with those security threats to get our information. Why? Because they want to be able to get things like R&D that they don't have to spend money on and they can get that R&D, right? So, you know, I, I jokingly pointed out to um, I, the number of years there was, there was a gentleman by the, in the UK called Gary McKinnon. You know, he ended up getting some information in a, in a NASA system and he saw everything else. I, I said, I, I welcome him to come to my desktop at work because if he took a look at the UFO stuff that I had, he'd have a fun time looking at that, you know? Wow, the Army is actually really into this stuff if they came into my computer, right? So I'm going like, boy, you know, that's pretty interesting. But anyway, uh, to me, it's a situation, you know, just getting hacked. But we're always out looking at that, that cybersecurity concern. We're looking at the national security implications of this uh, phenomena, if you would. Uh, it's not, I understand that the, the United States government wants to do what it can around this thing, but I, I really strongly encourage that, that there needs to be some sort of, you know, sharing amongst our uh, uh, other people that are friendly and everything else that we can have, conferences like this and everything else, because I really believe that collaboration is going to help and getting scientists around the world engaged is also going to be able to help us out. So I think that that's an important point that I just wanted to make. Uh, and then we have to figure out, well, how do we not get into sources and methods and all that wonderful stuff that's in the classified world? And I, I've also struggled with the fact that there's a lot of information out there that, that literally I see on the cybernet and things like that that could be shared. If you redact certain pieces of information and everything else, uh, you, you can do that. And so uh, I just... My hope is that, that ultimately we can do that delicate balance, but figure out how we can be more transparent and open about things. Uh, and uh, 
I don't know, does that answer the question at well, all? I, I would say, yeah, no, that was a great, great But I was gonna say also spectrum, because you, you did that bring was, up the spectrum. That was where I was, I was So spectrum in the, in, in the context, and I think that, you know, if you talk to Travis Taylor in this room, you'd see that he was trying to look at implications and stuff like that from across the spectrum out at the Skinwalker Ranch, right? It was like, you know, going across the, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And, you know, our combat systems and things we have for our defense rely on those kinds of things and that they don't interfere, right? I mean, we're communicating with a pilot between a pilot and a ship and everything else. And all those communications things rely on that, that radio frequency that they've got. And, and you can't have that overlapping concern from other things that are interfering with it. Well, if UAP are having an impact, and that's why you would like, well, what frequency was it? And then I need to find out, went out and work it out. That's why you have all these people to be able to work through those things to be able to do that. And I think that, you know, the, the spectrum uh, is, a, is a great part of our discovery about this phenomena. And we need to look at multi, multi parts of the spectrum. And I'm thrilled by the fact that if you have infrared, you're out of the visible part of that spectrum, right? And the, the spectrum is huge. I mean, in either end, you know? So why don't we start looking at these things from those other advantage points? And I think that that's needs to, we need to look at that as well. I, I think, Rich, uh, your comments are, are spot on. I, I think, if I, if I may, understanding the ability to properly measure and document specific signatures using whatever means available to, to the civilian side of the house, I think is a great uh, strategy to collect data. Uh, I can see uh, Dr. Shadegas, uh knowing him as well as I do, has something he wants to add to that. So go ahead, Matt. Yes, yeah, so on the issue specifically of signer, signature management, actually, that's one of the uh, observables, if I'm not mistaken. That's why exactly why you need multimodal sensors because it is, even if you had a civilization potentially or technology far more advanced than us, it'd probably be impossible, almost impossible or really hard to mask all your signature in all the different possible ways. So in fact, there's historical evidence of this. This goes back to the 1990s with cases in um, Mexico where you had objects that were visible in infrared, invisible to the naked eye and vice versa that don't make any sense. We have the, you have your lenses invisible and infrared pointed at the same proportion of the sky. And one sees nothing and one sees a very clear object. So I think that uh, this issue of signature management, there's been, Lou Alzano's talked about this, is a really important one. And how you get around that is by having multimodal sensors. It was called for by the UAP task force. Um, and uh, we did this on, on UAPX, as we're talking about uh, tomorrow, partnering with SCU to analyze the data we have. And again, no mention in the congressional hearing, even though we did exactly what the UAP task force called for last year, uh, we went and did it, but um, no recognition and credit for that whatsoever um, on the Hill. And, and the whole approach was, is you don't just also, it's not just different frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum, you have to go beyond that as well. As, and we see this in all fields of science, and especially um, in astronomy. You learn more the more new vistas you open up. Suddenly you realize, oh, you weren't listening to that part of the universe, and you don't even know what's there. In the history of astronomy, this happened with development of telescopes that didn't just do visible light. Right, we have radio telescopes. We have the cosmic microwave background studied a different way. We have telescopes across the electromagnetic spectrum, but the electromagnetic spectrum is not everything there is. We then developed gravitational waves with LIGO and Virgo, and suddenly now we're, we're looking at a completely different part of the universe. Maybe a few centuries we'll talk about how like, oh, you know how we used to look using light at the universe, and now we use gravity because it's so much better. Like, these are the things we need to consider is also is really, um, really outside the box thinking on the type of uh, uh, sensors we want to use. That's great, Matt, thank you. I, I, I hope it's, uh, it's evident to, to the audience that what we're trying to do here is tease out some thoughts. And the theme, the theme so far, at least in my mind, is you know, for those of you out in the field that are, that are really studying this or investigating it, technical collection or technical analysis is critical. Uh, data sharing and collaboration is critical. Uh, 
and intelligence-driven analytic methodology is critical. A multimodality sensor strategy is critical. Uh, use infrared, but use thermal as well. Understand the different spectrums that you're dealing with. Electromagnetic frequency detection is important. Uh, but it, it can't be just one or the other. It's got to be an all the above approach. And in order to understand the phenomenon truly from a technical perspective, that's the only way to do it because invariably what one individual may see in one region of the world using technical means may not be the same capability others are seeing in other parts of the world. And it's not all the same. And it, again, it's important to use technical methods, but a multimodality approach. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to point out to you that, like, for example, those devices that we're putting on the installations for looking for drones, allegedly. What happens if one's not a drone? Okay, you know, you get the idea, right? But anyway, we're using acoustics, we're using spectrum, and we're using everything from, like, sonic. You know, I, I, we're looking for, uh, we're also looking for radar. We got all those devices there. To be able to, and that's the kind of approach that I'm talking about where you're starting to get all those different other sensors, if you would, that feeds you information to allow the individual then to go take control of that individual's drone and we can drop it. We can find out where the operator is off base and we have the means of doing that as well, right? If it's a drone, what happens if it's not a drone? You know, if it's a UAP, will these things work? And I can give you an example in just the USS Kearsarge, in a sense where they had two systems that were allegedly supposed to be able to go and to do that drone killing. They didn't work. Okay? So what does that tell you? If it wasn't a drone and we couldn't take over, what was it? How are we going to distinguish that? From a national security standpoint, if I'm on the ship, are these hostiles or not hostiles? And I can't discern whether it's a drone or I can't determine whether it's a UAP, right? So you come back to why are we talking about national and threat management? Right. I think, Rich, I think a key uh, <laughs> point was, you know, along with all the other types of sensors, acoustic is an important, important part of it as well. Uh, Dr. Nolan, any, any comments or thoughts? Yeah, I mean, right. I... He touched on uh, one of the things that I, I find interesting is w what are we not listening to that's there? Yeah. Uh, and the other one is, is there a signal already being sent to us? Right. So there's signal that you hear about, right? People hear things in their head. How are they doing that? Right. right? W what is that? You know, how are they reaching into people's brains, affecting the proteins in ways that we can't possibly understand that get turned into a signal in our head. So somehow the information comes from over there where we don't understand it to over here where at least we can turn it into an electrical signal understanding and say, okay, well, but then how does that turn into consciousness and where do, how, do, how do such complex concepts get passed over? So that's a kind of signal. And then I think of these objects individually and how they coordinate. So how are they coordinating with each other, right? Do they just know ahead of time what they're gonna do? or is there some very low level EM going between them or something behind the scenes down under into some other quantum level that they're interacting with each other? So uh, to me, th that is not just a question, it's a practicality opportunity. Right. If they're doing it, how are they doing it and how can we replicate it? I mean, that's what gets me excited because I'm interested, I mean, again, going back to my cancer work, I look at stuff, I figure something out, and I go, oh, wow, okay, we can use this, I can make this instrument, and I can give everybody else the possibility to do this. So that's, that's yet another, I think, thing that, I think, it's I think we're being given a signal somehow. There's clearly something emanating that is not passive that we need to understand. But they affect our planes, right? I mean, they reach in, turn stuff off. They, re they reach in and read stuff from people's heads. What is that? So the, the ability, if it's emanating the the, at some point, uh, or to some degree, there's an opportunity to intercept that emanation, exploit it, and understand it. So again, I think for the, for the purposes of the audience, uh, 
it's just important to emphasize a multimodal collection strategy in whatever the organization is and, and use those uh, well-established, well-defined analytic methodologies to really dig into your data and understand what it is you've actually collected and, and how to make that information uh, meaningful to the end user. So I want to thank everybody for their comments. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Nolan. What new technologies could be developed to better understand the uniqueness of potential material designs that would be aligned to production methodologies involved in the development of craft with performance characteristics that mimic UAP capabilities? So, you know, the, again, I'm sorry that I keep going back to my standard academic work, but we try to understand the body by breaking down uh, pieces into organs, cells, uh, proteins, RNA, atoms. At the end of the day, what the real answer is to understand form and function is where the atoms are positioned uh, in these objects that we're interested in and how they interact with each other. And so let's say that one of us were given a piece of technology that, you know, bar no uh, hoax, is clearly from one of these objects. How are we going to understand it? Um, and so, you know, we have, many of the people in this room are, are well-versed in the kinds of technologies that can be used, everything from mass spec, x-ray crystallography, blah, blah, blah. But we do not yet have a technology that lets us look down to the atomic level, right, and see exactly where things are. Because at, at one point, we're going to need to engage the scientific community with, we'll, we'll have the ability someday to do that, right? And so then we hand uh, this to other scientists and we say, okay, we have no idea what the function of the object was that this came from. But can you tell me why somebody would put this atom next to that atom next to that atom next to that atom? Because as we know, in all science, you can have all of these different functions of things, and then emergent properties arise out of the interaction of multiple systems. So, I mean, this is where we're at. We haven't even collected the parts p list yet of what it is that we're dealing with. I mean, so for instance, if I were given a bunch of parts of the, of the stealth B-52 bomber, Right, uh, one from the leading edge of the plane, one from the this, one from the that. You know, one part is involved in stealth, the other is involved in lift, the other is just basically somebody scrawled their name on the thing, <laughs> right? So, uh, and then how do I put all those pieces together and how do I know what they are? We need a forensics approach from the bottom up and to collect and create an ontology, basically a list of, of parts and things. And then that then, I think, points us in a direction of of exploitation and making things. And, you know, practicality is one thing, but this is a discussion about uh, national security. If we don't do this now, you can be sure the Chinese are doing it right. last week, right? And the, I'm telling you, if, if you've got something that's doing what we're seeing, you're, you're looking at thousands of technology revolutions ahead of us. You get any one of those working uh, for everything from gravity, et cetera, communications, we're in big trouble. I think that's a great point. I know a lot of people uh, have interacted with some uh, discord over using uh, the phraseology of national security in relation to the scientific study of UAP. But the, the, the reality is there are objects that are performing with uh, characteristics that are not in the U.S. inventory, at least that anyone's willing to admit to. Uh, the general consensus is that these entities, these vehicles, are uh, not in the Russian or Chinese inventory either. Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of any government authority. I'm just simply reiterating what seems to be the general consensus within the public domain, but they're out there. That's the bottom line. They're out there. They're outmaneuvering our, uh, our aircraft, as Ryan so graciously characterized yesterday. They're performing in a way that we can't keep up with. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that if it's not us, and we don't think it's Russia or China, uh, to your point, that Russia or China is, is obviously going to be striving for those capabilities simply because we we can't well, match them right now. You can be sure that they're watching right now. 
Right. You know. And Kevin Newth did an amazing, uh, was involved in an amazing uh, paper published, right, on if an object about a ton moves from the level of the sea to, you know, space in less than a second, entire energy output of the United States in a, in a day. And they do these things at will. What does that imply? Right. Well, it implies if anybody understood it, it's a bomb of, we probably blow up this, this area of the galactic arm if we misused it. Um, but, you know, there's, I, I think there's, you know, if we don't get scared about it, it's like, how do we entice policymakers with the opportunity, right? Not just to protect ourselves, but to also exploit and move ourselves forward. That's a great, that's a great point. I think understanding the design, the production methodology, uh, even, even if it's just a simple piece of chaff or material, the ability to model that uh, positionally at the atomic level, while that capability does not exist, that's very likely the level of depth we'll need to go to as a, as a scientific community to understand what we typically categorize as metamaterial, mm -hmm. why it operates that way or why it functions that way and how it was produced. Rich? I was just going to say that, like, right here at the Arsenal, there's an organization called the uh, MISIC, which is the Missile Space Intelligence Center. And, you know, going back to your point about, you know, you get an aircraft and you can figure out where you take those parts and pieces. Well, you know, we, uh, and, and when I was growing up in Dayton, Ohio, they had Foreign Technology Division. They, these are the places where they would send the, the missiles from other countries or whatever like that. They would send them to these locations. And then these engineers get together and figure out, what does this do? What does that do? You know, and they're tearing it apart to figure out how does it operate? How does it, how does it move? How does it do what it does? What is the purpose of this? And so, but they didn't get down to the level of granularity of like single atoms and, and things like yeah. that, you know, that, like you're talking about. You know, they were, and then plus, they knew that how it was used because they, it landed and it was shot off of a rocket. So they had a little bit more of an awareness for that. When you're dealing with something novel, I mean, you know, it's like it's, you've never seen this before. You know, these kind of mixtures of these, uh, the, these things, these elements and things like that coming together in, in a way you've never seen it that's a whole other equation. Yeah. And then you're trying to interpret, well, where does this, is this the, uh, you know, the stick that they use to be able to do that or that? And, and it's just, it's, it's a very big challenge. I just want to underscore that and put yeah. that in the context. Appreciate it, Rich. Yeah. Gents, any other questions or comments? Yes, so I have uh, several, I, I want to say I'm very skeptical on the whole reverse engineering thing from two aspects. One is for allegedly advanced civilizations, they seem to crash a lot. So that's really striking, it's extremely odd. And that tells me if it is real, then maybe we're dealing with a defunct, uh, the detritus of a defunct civilization like Avi Loeb suggests. Like it could be things that were built to last for millions of years, but then their time came up and machines break down. I think that's one possibility. It would still be way better, of course, than what we have, you know, computer breaks every few years, gotta get a new one. But the other thing is I'm skeptical if, uh, even if we had parts, obviously they denied it in the hearing, you know, what were they gonna, of course they were gonna deny it even if we had something. Um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of our ability to make any progress whatsoever. I think it would be like handing your laptop uh, to Michael Faraday in the 1890s. How much progress do you think he would make? One of the greatest minds of the 19th century. He would make none whatsoever. His, by the time the battery died also, he'd make even less progress on your laptop. Um, and I, I, I don't subscribe to the like mice versus humans. I think that analogy is too extreme. I think a better analogy is if we actually had parts of uh, uh, alleged parts of an alleged advanced civilization, I think the, a be the better analogy in my mind would be like we're like we're like the brightest minds of the 19th century. I think the only way to fix that is you need to have a, you need to have something like the Manhattan Project, except even 10 times bigger. You need thousands of scientists and, and you do working on it in, order, in the hope of making the faintest progress whatsoever. But I did have a question for Gary. I was confused by one thing. I've looked at individual atoms in grad school, so I'm not sure what you mean by we don't have the technology. We have the atomic force microscope and the yeah. scanning electron. But that doesn't tell you the structure of glass. That's it, doesn't, it doesn't tell you where the molecules or the atoms are. You, that's, so you mean like individual ones in three dimensions? Or yes. Three, okay, so yeah, I was, I'm thinking of the global properties. Yeah. You can see like a sea of atoms, but right. not, yeah. But if you could, for instance, yeah. with sub-angstrom resolution, determine the position of an atom, uh, you can tell whether it's in a, sub, in a single or a double bond. 
Uh, you know, and then you've got, I mean, just think of the things that we know that are complicated in some of the superconductors with perovskites and things. Mm -hmm. You know, you move, you move a rubidium from here to there, and it's not a superconductor anymore. You still don't understand how superconductors work. Exactly. You still don't understand. Well, I mean, I, I, and that's why I, I think, I, I agree with you that we're never going to rebuild one of these craft. Yeah. But even if I figure out, you know, so, for, so there are claims that, uh, that fiber optics came from this stuff, right? Y yes or no doesn't matter. It probably wasn't being used for what we're using it today. So even if I learn something new about how to use something from an atomic organization that I understand a new principle, that's an advance. I said, remember, I said thousands of advances. So maybe we make a half step with picking up the pieces. So that's what I'm excited about. I, I never expect that we're going to be rebuilding stuff and jetting around like the Jetsons. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think the important point, uh, and I agree, Gary, I think the important point is through the scientific study in, in this area, we can create innovation. We can mm -hmm. create new technologies, new capabilities, new, new approaches to understanding the unknown. And I, again, I think it takes uh, a little bit of outside the box thinking, uh, a lot of initiative, some personal courage, and a lot of collaboration. So I wanna, I wanna thank you all for your comments on this question. We're going to move to the last question and then take questions from the audience. Uh, the last question is for Dr. Shadegas. Matt, what new sensor or signature detection capabilities could be de developed to detect a visible or not visible UAP presence? So we don't even need new ones yet. We need to start applying more often the things that we already have in hand because what we have commercially available is already something that the, um, a, a, you know, a time traveler from the DOD from the 1980s would have been blown away by. You know, just your, your iPhone would have been a military secret if it fell into the, you know, the Pentagon in 1982 or something. So we have, we, what we need to do is just put to use first what we already have, and then we're going to learn what we need to improve it by looking at, so the, the complaint you always get, you have, you know, fuzzy, why do we still have fuzzy images of UFO, ha ha, that means not real. How do you expect to have a non-fuzzy image of something that's allegedly going Mach 60? It's just, these are idiotic criticisms from people who don't understand that this is a tough problem. So what we need to do, we need to start though with the tools we have and build from there. So yeah, our, our approach on UAPX was also to also not start from scratch, which seems to be a lot of uh, uh, approaches, but rather take some of the lessons from history and historical cases and say, what sensor would I have wanted to have if I was, um, you know, if I was in the car for the Cash Landrum case, or if I was Betty or Barney Hill, what modern piece of technology would I want? And use that as a question to motivate what can we do moving forward. Uh, Matt, I think that's outstanding. Again, everybody, I just want to I want to express one more time: the questions that were selected for this panel were very intentional. What we're trying to do is is generate thought leadership here. There's a lot of technology that's currently out there that if we use it in synchronization with each other, a lot of capabilities that if we fuse them together, integrate them, we create something that really hadn't previously existed in its own individual form prior to. More importantly, it's when you're able to do that using a multimodality approach, it's critical that you analyze the data in a manner that's consistent with the way the intelligence community does, and that's not that's not a big secret. There there are many different uh, open sources uh, to understand how the the government analyzes data, and that that is very powerful when put in the hands of somebody who's taken an approach, a data collection approach, technically that's consistent with what Matt's characterizing. Any questions or comments from the panel? No, okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from the audience, so I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to start with uh, some from the virtual community. The first question is, if UAP studies are only supported in the context of security concerns, 
we could ultimately lose if it's determined that UAPs pose no threat and the field is pushed back into the background again. I agree. We need to create the momentum for a scientific exploration becoming the major focus. Uh, okay. Uh, how do we encourage that shift? I think exactly what we're doing right now is how we encourage that shift. Focus on the technical, the technical collection process. Look at it by not attempting to gather the data using just one, one means of collection, one technology, one capability, but taking all the above approach. Look at infrared, thermal, acoustic, what's in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, what, you know, understanding the, the frequency analysis part of studying UAP, I think it's an all the above approach. And I think when you're able to do that, you're able to provide enough data to generate serious discussion by policymakers. Gary? You know, I, I, I'm an optimist. So I look at the data and see what, how, so the way around the problem of it just being a national security is to say there's opportunity. Absolutely. Right, and in, in the sciences, at least in, in biology, it was basic, bio, basic mechanism, basic science, which is just information for information's sake, put in the, put in the library. And then it started to become translational. And then translational was opportunity. And so that's how medicine and biology became biomedical research. Because there's this bed to bedside, sorry, bench to bedside opportunity here. And so that's how I think we engage the public and calm the fears, hopefully. I mean, look, anything that is found is going to be used for defense at some level. And should be, I think. Yeah. Defense of the nation, that's understandable. Rich? I, I think a lot's also going to come from the work that this gentleman's going to do, right? He's out there defining all of the, the mass int, the measures, signals, intelligence, and how we can collect it, right? I mean, it, ultimately, you're going to help to shape the conversation about where we ought to go and what kind of tools we need to be able to tackle that, and, and I, I'm excited about it. There's also a key point with that is Dr. Went brought up a great you know, point in his presentation about the ontological threat, right? So we have to understand that DOD is designed to fight and win wars. You know, Ryan brought that up yesterday, and I think that's something that we need to reaffirm, is, is that anything in DOD is going to be geared toward assessing whether or not, and when I say adversary, it could be our traditional adversaries and our non-traditional adversaries, or something we just don't know is going to be, we are assessing that through a threat matrix to determine what it can do to end the social contract of the United States. And, and that's important to understand that as we're trying to talk about how do we get information from the government, why is it parked in DOD, uh, how do we, uh, is it something that we can do on our own? And I think given what UAPX accomplished, it, this is definitely something that the community now has the capability to start assessing on their own and then running it through an intelligence analytic, a structured analytic technique used for intelligence analysis, which is a scientific process, which differs from a, sci differs from a scientific method. I don't need to start with, an, with a hypothesis when I'm doing my research. I can start with a question and a curation standard, because that is what Intel is, is. I seek to answer a priority information requirement or question, and then I have a curation standard for what I'm running my data through based off of that question. And then the output is a series of other techniques that are used to provide a predictive model. And so if we understand that when we say threat, we don't mean that you know, there, somebody could you know, park a bomb outside the you know, facility, whatever. It could be ontological. They could be friendly. And, and we just don't know it. But it still poses, there is still that gap of what is threat. And, and so as a scientific community is looking at it from a scientific proposition, there's also the value proposition on the strategic security element and the national security element that we have to look out for the interests of those of us sitting in this room, for the security interests of those of us in this room. Thank you, Josh. 
I think well, we've had a very, one thing I re that's been confusing about the government approaches, if you look the past few decades, but also now, even between different agencies, it's a very schizoid approach. It's like Schrodinger's cat. We've been told it's not a national security threat, don't worry about it. And now, yes, it is a national security <laughs> threat. So make up your mind, is dead. it or is it not a national security threat? <laughs> and I feel like you and Pete have had it both ways. And we saw that in the congressional hearing even. Yeah. Oh, it's not a big deal, let's smile you know, about it. And at the same time, it's a national security threat. So which is it? Right, so I, but I think, unfortunately, uh, to, to back to the original question, that, um, that fear of your security, physical or ontological, is unfortunately uh, a good motivator, and that's human nature. But I do think that we should not rely on that. I think we should be more positive, as Gary said, optimistic. But I do think that, unfortunately, security fears are motivator. But I wanted to also, it still bothers me, we still talk about national security or US security. If it is true we're talking about a non-human intelligence, that's irrelevant, it's global security. It's a worldwide phenomenon. So mm -hmm. do you think that if advanced civilizations exist, they care about our 200 warring tribes that we have in this country with different colors on the map? They don't care, the US versus Russia and China. All of that is irrelevant. If the ET or similar hypothesis is true, US security is irrelevant, national security irrelevant. It's a global problem for all of humanity. So one thing I would like to see is I'm still also so very realistic and also a patriot and recognize U.S. is still, one, of, d despite its flaws, is still one of the best countries on this planet. And we still have, I'm old fashioned, we still have good guys and bad guys. We see this every day. We look at Russia and Ukraine. Unfortunately, we can't work with everybody. But we should at least get the ball rolling working with friendly countries mm -hmm. and work with our allies in this. Stop treating this as a national security issue. If it is a security issue, it's not a national one. Delete the word national, it's global. It's not national. It's only national security if it's Russian or, or Chinese or foreign actor. But if it's a non-human intelligence, it's not national security, it's global. So start working with UK, NATO, our allies, at least with friendly countries, work together at least with them, even if we can't get the entire world on board because frankly, I know it's an oversimplification, we still have good guys and bad guys, unfortunately, in the 21st century, but we start working with friendly nations together to try to solve this global problem. It's not just over the US or US waters, it's all over the world people see UFOs and UAP. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate that. Uh, next question. For Dr. Nolan, which scientific discipline could possibly contribute to this field of study is most absent from the overall discussion on UAP? Wow. <laughs> I'm That's glad you got that one. one. <laughs> Saved you a good one, buddy. Take it. The, well, I think physics, quantum physics, you know, that there's something, there's something behind the scenes yet that we don't appreciate that they're exploiting. And so, you know, energy extraction, how are they doing it at the same time while not burning their ships to a cinder, right? So that to me is the thing that, but it's, it shouldn't just be theoretical, there's also, it's kind of the materials testing thing. I mean, some of the stuff that Ryan's doing, for instance, with the material, the AI materials analysis approach, is it, that's, an, that's an information science, you know, laboratory that you can set up in a computer. So there's really needs to be a lot more emphasis on that and then marrying that to the, to the actual physics of how the universe operates. But I think as well, and you know, I, I listen sometimes to, to Eric uh, and others, talk, you know, other physicists arguing with each other about what is the right m way to uh, interpret how the universe operates. You know, there's probably a hundred different ways to interpret it and they're all wrong, you know, but they should all be used as potential solutions. Right. It's the same thing that we say about the UAP. If you take the UAP answer off the table, you might have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity there that needs to be, you know, take. The, to me, that's the, the one least, I'm most interested in perhaps because I don't understand it as much uh, or as well as I should, but I think it's still something that really isn't talked about enough yet. Well, there's the resident physicist on the panel, as you said, we should also separate the possibility of physics versus engineering. Even though it's a low probability, I would say, I'm still open to the possibility that if there are advanced civilizations, actually, they're not using any new physics we don't understand already. It's, it's a question of engineering. We may have already some of the knowledge we need from general relativity and quantum mechanics, but we don't have the engineering. So here's an example of that. We had for centuries, the correct equations 
to use to figure out air travel. So why didn't we do it? We have Isaac Newton, we have Bernoulli, because it's not that simple. So sometimes it's a question of engineering. Sometimes it's a question of both. We absolutely don't know everything. We don't know how to marry relativity and quantum mechanics. We may discover that we need more paradigm shifts in physics, but I'm wondering is do we first need some paradigm shifts in engineering? We don't have, for example, we have not applied general relativity to propulsion. We're still centuries after Isaac Newton. Our only way of getting to outer space is throwing things out the back and conserving moment. That's all we know how to do. Why don't we, you know, engineer the space-time metric, things we've known for 100 years, because maybe we know the physics, but maybe we don't know the engineering. And if we don't know either the physics or the engineering, that's even worse. But like a homework problem I give my students, for example, I always point out and that you can get to the Andromeda galaxy in one human lifetime. The phys you don't need any new physics for that. You don't need any wormholes. You don't need fast and light travel. You just capitalize on relativistic time dilation. Quite problem is, is we don't have the fuel. So we have the engineering to do that. So we have to divorce their two levels of impossible or difficult, which is paradigm shifts in physics and paradigm shifts in engineering to apply the physics. And engineers, like my colleague, Professor Kevin Knuth always says, they're very good at finding loopholes taking the known laws of physics, chemistry, biology, and finding loopholes to make a technology works that looks like it's breaking the known laws of physics, but actually it's not. It's just that we were misinterpreting things we've already, that we've already known. So it's a combination of both things, unknown physics and unknown engineering, potentially, when we're talking about advanced uh, technology. Well, I'm ready for a bourbon. Uh, <laughs> that was great. No, I appreciate it, Matt. That's great. great. Uh, Great characterization and, uh, and, and outstanding perspective, as always. So we're running a little bit low on time, so I'm, I'm going to speed through a few of these, if that's okay, Rich. Sure. Okay. Uh, I, may, I may pose them to one uh, member of the panel, so if I, if I ask a, a specific panel member, let's just limit it to that individual, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next one, just to try to give all the questions uh, an opportunity to be heard. Should Congress appropriate funds for the scientific study of UAP by academ academia as a way to study outside of the national security arena? I think that's a no-brainer. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, there's, there's no reason in, in my mind why we couldn't use public data in the public yes. domain, unclassified <laughs> information, and provide that to universities and, uh, and organizations like the SCU and UAPX. Gary, just tipping my hat to you. Uh, but no, but I, I think that's, that's an imperative. I, I hope at some point this is a conversation with the National Science Foundation and, and we're able to have a thoughtful discussion about maybe topics, just topic studies that could be funded uh, without, without necessarily data being provided by, by the government, but just topic areas for, for general research. So whoever uh, posed that question, it's a great one. I, I totally agree. Uh, question for me, what, has, what areas have the most UAP sightings been? I've got to be honest, I, I think I would be stretching if I attempted to answer that. I'm going to look to Rich Hoffman for that. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. Are you Rich Hoffman? <laughs> Could you repeat the question, please? What, what areas, uh, I, I'm, I think they're speaking geographically, maybe a continent. Oh. What areas have had the most UAP sightings? Oh, my God. North America, South America. Well, you know, it, it's, it's an easy one, Rich. Well, I mean, it, it's difficult to say. I, I, Robert Powell did a great job of taking and plotting UFO sightings over a period of length of time, and it, you couldn't even see the U.S. map anymore because it was everywhere, right? You know, I mean, and, and you, if you took out the ones that you could come up logically with, then you would you, you might be able to say, well, they're highly populated areas, right? And then you say, well, like, well, okay, do farmers report the objects and stuff like that? Well, you know, many of them don't have internet, don't have any way of getting there, not familiar with MUFON or anybody else to report it. I, I would say that basically, you know, pretty much 
the vast part of the human population have seen something. The, the big problem is that nobody reports. So consequently, you get a situation where like, you know, it used to be in, in the days of Heineck and Valet, uh, they were going around giving and saying one out of every 12 sightings were being reported. Uh-uh. It's way higher than that. So you really don't know statistically where it is on the globe. So I appreciate that, so, Rich. Uh, yeah. We got a question from the illustrious Dr. Uh, Davis. Can make a comment to Rich. Rich, at NIDS, we gathered enough data such that we put a big giant wall map of the United States yeah. on a wall. And we realized from our data that all we had to do is throw a dart at the map. Wherever that dart yeah. landed, we right. go there, investigate, we'll find a mass. You, you will. Story that nobody talks right. about. Right. Uh, you know, I, I've, let me tell you, I've had people... I had a family that came up and they saw me on a television show in Dayton, Ohio, and he said, we had a sighting 48 years ago. We haven't told anybody you're the first person we've told it to. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that was that where they told me they were, they all lived around a lake or a pond, right? And they had seen an encounter in their back window with the lights. There was something over the pond. They didn't know what it was, right? They said the next day, the neighbor kid came over and was saying, hey, did you see the orange light hanging above the pond? <laughs> no, we didn't see it. Really? Tell us about it. And, and so the little kid would say, yeah, we all, we all watched the thing over the pond. We didn't know what it was. It was just hovering above the, 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 the water and stuff like that. Well, okay, now there's two houses. There's three houses around the pond, right? What about the third person? Yeah. I did a tracking down to find out, well, the, the, the husband had died. And the wife was there, and she proceeded to tell me her story about being around the pond. Did any of them report it? No. Yeah. So that's Help me out the there. challenge. You know, <laughs> one of the things I find fascinating about the numbers of reports is it's a pretty busy planet. Right. There's a lot of it stuff is. going on. And that really, it either scares me or excites me. I don't know which, a little of both. But there's a lot going on. And what does that mean? I, I mean, you, people should just, that's, I always say, when people say, oh, well, do you believe in UFOs? No, I don't believe in UFOs. I believe in data. Right. That's the data. Right. You tell me what it means. Right. And that usually gets their wheels turning. No, that's a great answer. I appreciate it. And, and just as an alibi, I have a feeling one of my kids submitted that question, so <laughs> I'm getting the high song from my wife. So dad, dad, dad says thanks. Uh, next question. Has anyone considered or are they looking at cataloging hyperspectral imaging, imaging, Mazint, SIGINT, ELINT, GEOINT, and data mining the aggregated intelligence? I have no idea. Not, I mean, that's a, that's a question that. Uh, that only someone in the government <laughs> could answer. And that's not, that's not any of us. Oh and uh, candidly, it would it would not be appropriate to answer that question, you know, even if we knew it, simply because that would that would that would truly put national security at risk. So, however, comma, I think that's a great question to present to your members of Congress. Yeah. Because if that's not happening, it's it's there's a congressional obligation to make sure that that's being done properly and and classified at the appropriate level, not overclassified. Mm -hmm. So uh, great question, whoever asked it. Thank you. Um, have you found any potential UAP medical signatures that will be important to study and may further help us understand the technologies being employed? The SCU does to my knowledge, have that information. So I, again, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. So I, again, I think that's a question uh, that I, I encourage everybody to provide their members of Congress. Rich. No. I was oh, just, okay. Just in a technical note, it's break time. Uh, we're okay. going to have to start. Want a break? We'll break. Yeah, uh, we got a presenter that okay. we're going to have to be bringing on. So I'm just going to share that. Everyone, uh, just one final note. Uh, I, I don't know where they are. I saw them floating around in the back. I just want to thank uh, Mr. George Knapp and Mr. Jeremy Corbell. They're in the building somewhere. 
Uh, gentlemen, we're honored to have you. Thank you for visiting Rocket City and showing up for the conference. I hope I, hope I didn't spoil the surprise. We're, we're thrilled to have you gentlemen here. Uh, thanks for visiting. And I want to thank all of you for your, your patience and your attention on this uh, panel discussion. And I want to thank each one of these gentlemen. They're all dear friends and respected colleagues. Thank you all for being a part of this, uh, this great discussion. And I think that's a break. Thank you. The people who actually have all the cases, who have the authority to release those cases, that's the deep state. And every country has a group like that, presumably in the bowels of its bureaucracy. So um, 
I mean, it's interesting. Wait, so wait, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rich. Could you repeat? Um, it was just getting your thoughts on that idea in terms of the fact that the government probably knows a lot more than they're really telling you, and they, you know, they're not, uh, they're not just talking about the, the, they don't understand or not aware of what the source is. Yeah, no, I think the government clearly knows much more whether they, um, of course, the government is not a unitary body. It's presumably the people who have access to these cases, they may disagree among themselves about what the cases represent. Um, but yes, they may know more. They may have a pretty good idea that these things are not human. I would guess they have a pretty good idea of that. If they don't have that idea, then I'm not sure what's going on. So in that sense, um, they may know more, but they don't have any idea what to do with it. So yes, and then that's part of the secrecy. On the other hand, that may be good. Maybe they're telling a noble lie here and they're trying to protect us from the truth because if we're not ready to hear the truth, then all hell breaks loose. In the case of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that's going on, it's been going on for quite some time, uh, what do you think about the possibility that it could actually draw hostile aliens to the Earth? Well, it's always possible. Um, you know, there are arguments, as everybody here knows, that as any civilization that lasts long enough to be able to travel interstellar differences, distances will probably be nonviolent because if they're violent, they're likely to get destroyed. Um, but that's all very theoretical. Nobody really knows. Um, I think there is some chance of hostile aliens. On the other hand, what do we really have to offer? Why would they want to conquer us? They can just take whatever they want without killing anybody. So, and it does seem as if they have some kind of an, a Star Trek style prime directive of non-interference because um, they're not bothering us right now. Um, but again, I, no one can rule that out. And that's one more reason to actually be concerned about the UAP science, not to stop it. I mean, I think we need to keep it going obviously, but this is another potential risk that we're running. Should the soft sciences and political sciences be a key supporting component of the SCU's organizational strategy? Well, I think one of the things that I've really been struck by in all the publicity around Avi Loeb's initiative and a lot of the discussion that's happened the past year, I don't see social scientists anywhere on the horizon, or at least social scientists who are sort of regular practicing social scientists. Um, so I think that's a problem. I think this issue is not just a scientific issue. It is definitely that, obviously. But it's also a political and a social issue. And I think we've got to get people, you know, if not me, but other people involved in this so that we can start thinking the issues through. Um, do you see uh, do you see appreciation of social movement theory models to determine social reactions to UAP disclosure? Well, that's, that's interesting. I don't know much about the social movement literature. There's a whole academic literature on this. Um, and there's actually not just social movements, but one could imagine a lot of psychological research, social, sociological research on how people might react. Um, one of the papers I assigned in my seminar last uh, spring was a paper about how do people react to uh, panic and disasters, which was, you know, had nothing to do with UAP, but it was fascinating discussion about panic in disaster situations. So I think there is a lot of literature that social scientists have already produced that at least indirectly speaks to these issues, but not in a direct way. So it's a matter of connecting the dots as much as anything, I think. Okay, well, another question here. What role do you see strategic security research taking to address the existential threat that UAP pose? Well, I mean, if, this, if the strategic thinking is about physical security and worrying about being attacked, well, that is sort of an important question. I guess the military should worry about how they're going to deal with an invasion if that actually happened. Again, I think that's very unlikely. If the threat is ontological, though, that's a different kind of threat. And the military may not be able to deal with that. That may be a public relations issue. That may be a job for scientists or social scientists or whatever. So. Um, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Alex, uh, we're going to stop at that point because we're getting ready for uh, lunch right now. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we appreciate your flexibility and your, so, your, your willingness to uh, be patient while we work through the technical issues. And, uh, but uh, it did come out very well. We were able to hear what you had to say, your presentation. I think we'll work on it so that when you're joining us tomorrow virtually that you don't go through Hoover, but you'll just use the link. Uh, the Zoom link that we send to you again, okay? Uh, but we want to, let's have a big round of applause for Alex. Uh,
Well, well, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. All right. Well, that concludes uh, this portion of it. We're, I think, pretty much back on track in terms of our schedule, which is good. Uh, and then we're going to come back after that and we'll have our national security implications of studying scientifically uh, UAP. Uh, we'll have a panel here for that. All right. Thank you. See you in a bit.